Yeah, welcome to our monthly emergency care talks. And this month we discuss triage, both in the pre-hospital and in-hospital setting. And uh, uh, with us is uh, emergency um, care physician based in Germany this month. Uh, uh, it's called Florian, passionate about pre-hospital care and uh, emergency care. And so he'll be taking us through the first part of the presentation where we'll be discussing pre-hospital uh, triage and then we'll have some nice examples of how you can do triage and you can all get to participate and then uh, go into AD triage and also get a chance to triage some patients. So without much further ado, I'll invite Florian to take over, introduce himself, tell us what he's doing, why he's here, how come he's on this other side of the world and um, take it from there and make the presentation. Uh, as, a, as a guide, remember, if you want have a question, you can always put up uh, put it on the chat, uh, raise your hand up, and uh, we will then allow you, you should be, we will call on you to unmute, and then you can ask a question. So, but it's supposed to be very social, conversational, so go ahead, Florian. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Thank you for the nice introduction. You said the most important things already. So I'm coming from Germany. I'm joining from Munich, Germany this morning. And it's morning here too. So it's just one hour different uh, time to Kenya. Um, so we have eight o'clock in the morning now here in Munich. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about pre-hospital mass casualty incident triage today. Um, and I put a second topic uh, to my presentation today, finding the the sickest in case of mass casualty incidents because this is what triage is about. I mean, of course, we want to differentiate between who is severely injured or who is less severely injured. But the important thing is to find out the most critical patients as fast as possible to get them the best treatment and raise their opportunities to survive the incident. As you already said, my name is Dr. Florian Fiegbert. I'm from uh, Munich, Germany. Uh, I'm a trained anesthesiologist. I'm an ICU consultant. So usually I'm working on an 18 bed anesthesiological ICU here at Munich University Hospital. We are doing the most extended care of uh, ICU care that you can imagine. So um, these are 18 ventilator beds. We have 18 di dialysis machines. We have 10 liver dialysis machines. We can run up to 14 ECLS systems, so ECMO, for the oxygenation of the blood outside the body. Um, so we are doing some kind of high class um, ICU medicine in here. Also, I'm an EMS director here at the Munich County, and I'm in an emergency medicine consultant. Um, I'm working on the helicopter we have here at our hospital. So we operate two HEM systems in Munich, um, two helicopters here for the area. One is based at our university hospital. We have uh, approximately 2,200 beds in total. Um, up to 420 ICU beds at the moment because of COVID-19. And I'm also working on this helicopter as hands physician. I'm a reserve uh, Lieutenant Colonel of the German Navy. Um, so in case there would be war, I could be called into the Navy, but uh, usually I'm only teaching at the German Armed Forces a medical institution we have here in Munich. So we have the Central Academy for all medical stuff for the complete German Armed Forces. This is located here in Munich and I'm teaching there. Also, I'm a father and a husband of a two and a half year old daughter. And this is simply what I'm doing every day. So I'm rotating between the ICU, the operation theater, only rarely, I have to say, and the pre-hospital setting, either on physician response units, as we do it here with cars or with the HEMS unit, so with the helicopter. I would like to give you some introduction to my presentation today because during the presentation you will find several QR codes and there are two types of QR codes. I put in black QR codes for you that if you scan them with your mobile device give you direct impression into the papers I'm citing or into further information you can get. Many of the papers are free open access so if you scan the QR code, you will directly go to the PDF and uh, can check out the complete paper later. And also there are red QR codes and red QR codes always lead to videos. So they are linked. Usually you go to YouTube then and you can see a video directly and get more impression about what I'm talking about uh, today 
for triage at mass casualty incidents. I have no conflict of interest, and if I have any products placed in this presentation, I don't get any beneficial uh, any benefits uh, from the companies that are running those. So, um, totally no conflict of interest. Let us talk about what are we going to hear in the next 45 minutes. It's about the definition of a mass casualty incident first. So what are we talking about? What is a mass casualty incident? How can we look at this topic? And after we define this, we will go to the pre-hospital management of mass casualty incidents. So it's not about the triage first, it's about um, the total management of the pre-hospital uh, setting in mass casualty incidents. After that, we are going to follow to the pre-hospital triage. We will look to several systems that are on the market. We will compare them, look how is data, how is research on them. So what is beneficial, what is perhaps not. And we will have a look into the future. So what is the future going to bring us? Are there any technical developments that can make triage more efficient or more easy in the future. Also, we will try to find a recommendation for a structured approach uh, for mass casualty incidents in Kenya. So this is what we want to talk about. Let's talk about the definition first. So if you think about what is a mass casualty incident, I'm sure you will have some pictures in your mind because every one of us does. Just think about perhaps big terroristic uh, incidents like 9-11 in New York, um, where in Manhattan um, this uh, massive attack was and this planes crashed into the World Trade Center. I mean, it's clear that this is something we can call a mass casualty incident because if a building of this size collapses, um, it's very clear. But it's not always this spectacular and it doesn't have to be as big as this to be called a mass casualty incident. And this is what we want to put the spotlight on now. So the definition of a mass casualty incident. A mass casualty incident or called MCI is an overwhelming event which generates more patients at a time than local available resources can manage using routine procedures. It requires exceptional emergency arrangements, additional or extraordinary assistance. What does this tell us? And I believe this is a very good definition that the guys uh, around Lomalio uh, found out there. It depends on your system when the level of mass casualty incident is reached. So if you are in a system with very strong hospitals, many big strong hospitals with very strong emergency departments, and you also have a very good EMS system, a lot of ambulances, well-trained paramedics, special response unit, um, all this kind of stuff, then the level of MCI can be reached much later than if you have a weak system, weak hospital infrastructure or weak EMS systems, because it always depends on how many patients you can treat in normal business. So this is basically what the definition of a mass casualty incident is. As soon as your capacity is overwhelmed, and it, it doesn't depend on the capacity of pre-hospital or in, in hospital. So as soon as the capacity is overwhelmed, it will be a problem and it will be a mass casualty incident per definition. So Let's compare two, um, two types of MCI, perhaps, yeah, because it's both MCI, multi casualty incident, or mass casualty incident. When I did some research on this topic, I found that there are some papers calling it multi casualty incident, and there are some papers calling it mass casualty incident. And I tried to figure out if we can differentiate between those two. So, if we look to multi-casualty incidents, normally the number of ill or injured patients is higher than you have it in the normal daily business. So if we think about ambulance systems, usually there is one patient, one ambulance will respond there. Perhaps you have a traffic accident um, with two or three patients, so two or three ambulances are going to respond there. But multi-casualty could, for example, be traffic collision between a car and a minibus or something like this. We have five, six, or seven patients. So this is per definition what we could, could call a multi-casualty incident. 
The incident needs a certain management structure on scene because if only one ambulance will come and you have seven patients, you need to manage who needs treatment first, who needs to be uh, rushed to the hospital, who can be treated on scene, who can go home. So it needs some kind of management structure on the scene. Incidents like multi-casualty incidents need patients spread to several healthcare facilities because usually one hospital is not able to treat seven injured patients at one time, for example. So this is why you have to separate the patients to different hospitals. And the event can be managed with normal on-duty resources. And this is the interesting thing. And this is what is characteristic for multi-casualty incidents. It will stress you but it won't overstress you. So the normal resources in the pre-hospital setting, but also in the in-hospital setting, will be operating this easily. So you have enough ambulances on call usually so that you can dispatch them and they will do this. What is now a mass casualty incident? A mass casualty incident, as we said before, is an extraordinary event with a number of ill or injured patients that is higher than your capacity in the healthcare system, both pre-hospital and in-hospital. Triage is necessary to identify the most critical patients and command structures on scene are extremely necessary because otherwise it will be only chaos and people will be triaged later. The hospitals will need to prepare for MCI response so they will need to activate their mass casualty incident response plans uh, however they might look. So this is the difference between a multi-casualty incident and a mass casualty incident. Let us take a brief look on the pre-hospital management of mass casualty incidents now. I would like to show you something and I prepared this here because this comes from the United, uh, from the World Health Organization, I'm very sorry. The World Health Association uh, published this as a paper, mass casualty management systems and strategies and guidelines for building health sector capacity. It is from 2007, but there is no more actual version of this. And if we put it to Kenya now, we see on the lower part of uh, this slide, the mass casualty incident happens. And usually there should be clear communication to the local emergency control center and the authority. And I put this obstacle in here. So obstacle one is already between the mass casualty incident and the local emergency control center. Because in Kenya, we face severe problems in communication in case of emergencies, and we don't have countywide emergency control centers placed all over the country. So some counties, of course, do great work and already have some kind of local control center, but not all do. So the first obstacle is already there. You can see the whole thing goes into the yellow field, then the local emergency planning preparedness committee uh, with the mayor on the local level, uh, they will uh, do decisions here. But if we look to the next step, so if it gets a little bit bigger and it goes over the size of a local emergency control center, it would go to a provincial or state emergency control center authority. And we have the second obstacle here because in Kenya, we don't have the structures right now and we don't have defined communication ways this is making MCI management on scene perhaps more difficult than it had to be. By the QR code in the right lower um, edge you can access this paper from the World Health Organization directly. So let us take a look into Kenya. If in Kenya any kind of accident or incident or injury happens, there is no nationwide call number that is working, that is bringing people to help immediately. So this is a problem we face. You can't just dial 999 or as we have it here in Germany, 112 as an EMS shortcut number all over the country and can be sure that you will be directly linked to the next EMS call and dispatch center. This 
one you see here is our new EMS uh, call and dispatch center here in Munich. So it has just opened last year. And um, this is how things could look like if you organize a big city or the big city and the county around it. So we are missing this at the moment in Kenya. And as you can imagine, this makes it more difficult in case of mass casualty incidents, because if calls are not centralized and if you don't have this central shortcut call number that is toll free, of course, perhaps people are not able to call it because they lack money on their mobile phones or whatever. And the second step is if calls are not made to one central institution, like a centralized call center, calls will reach different agencies, different people with different knowledge levels, and this will make the response even more difficult. I would like to show you this to you in the next slide. So what are the consequences for the call of help at the moment in Kenya? We don't have a uniform EMS shortcut toll-free call number. As I said before, there is no central dispatch and coordinator uh, centers. Every agency dispatches its own resources. So if you call the Red Cross, they will send Red Cross ambulances. If you call St. John, they will send St. John ambulances. If you call MSF, they will send the MSF ones and you understand how the system works. So there is no interprofessional communication between these agencies in normal settings. So everyone is doing his own thing. And at the moment, we don't have standardized alarm plans. So there are no MCI levels, for example, if I can talk shortly about our system here in Munich. So, of course, we have quite a strong EMS system here and also a very strong hospital system. So usually up to, let's say, eight patients. This is what we do in everyday business. So if there are eight patients on scene, nothing will be activated. We will just do it with normal ambulances. There will be just an EMS coordinator on scene. So it's uh, some kind of ambulance officer that will be there, um, but nothing else happens. If we have higher numbers of patients, so between eight and 15, this is what is MCI level one here. MCI level one is still done with normal resources here in Munich. So we will send normal ambulances, normal physician response units, HEMS units, and all kind of stuff. And there will be just a short information from the EMS dispatch and call center to the hospitals that there is a class one incident um, so they are informed, but nothing will happen at the hospital. So they will continue their normal work because they can treat this number of patients because we can spread them to so many hospitals. From 15 to 30 patients, we will have level two of an MCI here in Munich. This will include that volunteer units are alarmed here. They are very professional. So they have the same qualifications as the normal ambulances have, paramedics on EMTs on, and they are just called from home or from work and they will do it voluntarily. Also, we have some special vehicles to install treatment centers on scene and they will be alarmed then. And if we have an MCI of level two, also the hospitals will stop their operation, uh, normal operational program and prepare for MCIs. But if you don't have this standardized alarm plans, everyone will just send whatever he thinks is right. So perhaps just imagine, I will show you this on the next slide, calls go to different agencies and everyone is thinking, okay, I need to send all my ambulances because there are many patients. Perhaps you will have more ambulances than you even need on scene and they are not free for other calls. So what is the consequence of no standardized alarm plans and the other features I gave here? Information will be at different locations at different times and there is a lack of communication. So this is something quite important in this setting. I tried to get it some kind of visual for you. So in the left of this slide, you can see this mass casualty incident occurring. Doesn't matter what kind of MCI it is, but some kind of mass casualty incident happens. And you have these three guys here, and they are eyewitnesses. They see the mass casualty incidents and they decide, I would like to call for help. So the lady in the top, she's using her cell phone, using call number A and giving information A 
two in this, uh, this case, E+, plus, so the Red Cross Emergency Ambulance Service. The second guy in the middle, he's using his cell phone with call number B and information B because he has seen different things than the lady above and he is calling St. John. And the third guy, the lower one, he's using his mobile phone with call number C and information C because he did see the mass casualty incident from another side. Perhaps he's a medical professional and he already has seen that there are many severely injured patients. And he is using call number C, as I said, with information C and he is calling some other private institution or governmental uh, ambulance service or whatever. So three different call numbers and of course, we could put additional five people because we have additional serves. So the problem is not only that all these calls go to different emergency providers, but the problem also is that information A, information B and information C are separated. They are not put together. So there is no whole picture in the EMS dispatch and control center because there are barriers between them. They are not communicating with them, uh, each other. So E plus will dispatch uh, its own resources, send ambulances. St. John will do the same. The other ambulance provider will do th the same. And then it could be that it happens what I told you before that too many ambulances are on scene that you don't even need or that important information will be lost because there's no communication and no coordination between the agencies. So I think I could visualize a little bit where the problem is. This communication between agencies, it is so necessary because only this will make it possible to have coordination between the ambulance services and the emergency services. So a central call, and dispatch unit would be very helpful. I use this slide from another presentation I was holding for some guys at the Ministry of Health. So it's a complex system and it will only work as a whole system. So the emergency treatment of patients can only work if bystanders do their work, call for an ambulance, if there is a sufficient response to this call, if there is a centralized call center structure, if there is a centralized dispatch, if a ambulance service is working well, and it doesn't depend on what logo is on, on the ambulance, um, it, it totally doesn't matter to me. It matters that there is a good response and a good working system. And also it matters that the hospitals are integrated into this system because definite treatment will be not on scene, it will be at the hospitals. And hospitals need to prepare their infrastructure for mass casualty incidents. So as you can see on this slide, it is a complex and a whole system that is needed to run the management of a mass casualty incident well. Otherwise, it will always go into chaos and otherwise, it will cost life or limb because patients are not treated as they should be. Let's take a look to this now. I try to visualize once again how a framework for the pre-hospital management of MCIs in Kenya could look like. So we have a incident happening. I took this explosion because it looks really nice. And again, we have our bystander. He's an eyewitness. He notices, okay, there was an event. And he takes his cell phone now and uses a national shortcut toll-free emergency call number. I took 112 this time. So this is our call number here in Europe. Um, just information for you, we implemented 112 all over Europe. So it doesn't matter where you are in Europe. If you call 112, you will be directly linked to the next emergency call center. And this is a big step we achieved here. So he is taking his phone, calling this number, and he will come to a central EMS calling dispatch center. There will be a trained dispatcher, not somebody that is just manning the telephone. He's a trained dispatcher and he will ask several questions where is the exact location of the incident? What has happened? How many patients can you see? Can you see if they are severely injured? And all this kind of stuff. And he will give instructions to the bystander to explain what he can do to help the people here or to help the EMS services. And there will be a central alarm structure going out of this dispatch center 
all necessary EMS providers will be alarmed. So this is just an example. Again, we have E plus here, St. John, and I put in the fire brigade. So every one of them will be alarmed through the central dispatch center. Um, this alarm um, should best be in a very direct way. So you don't need to call every ambulance station, but you have some kind of pages or radios or whatever to just get everyone that is necessary very quickly so that the response time, the time between the call goes into the dispatch center and the cars are going out is as short as possible. And later then, we will have a first unit on scene and it doesn't depend on what unit it will be if it comes from the Red Cross or St. John or any other ambulance organization, but there will be a first unit on scene. And these units, they will all be trained in mass casualty incidents. So what will the first unit do? It will do sighting on the situation. It will look around what has happened here and they will do a short risk assessment. So can we work here? Are there dangerous goods? Um, is there anything we need to be aware of? Uh, just think of terroristic incidents or whatever. It will also define a CCP and CCP stands for casualty collecting point. So they will define on a strategic approach where all the victims should be brought to. So they will be centralized. And this is what we call a casualty collecting point. And most important, they will directly give feedback to the central EMS call and dispatch center to tell them if resources are enough right now, or if perhaps even more resources are needed. So it is a communication circle. Yeah? It's not only in one way, but it will close this circle. So they will give feedback to the dispatch center so that they can take new actions. Following units on scene will start pre-hospital triage, they will order the space, so they will make structures clear to uh, treat patients, and they will, of course, then treat patients by um, the triage, so critical first, then the less critical, and so on. And of course, there is some kind of EMS command structure needed. I know right now at the moment, usually in Kenya, the military or the police will take over the on-scene command of mass casualty incidents. And this is okay to me, but the problem is usually the soldiers or police officers are no medical professionals. So of course they can take the overall command structure, but we will need a EMS command structure on scene to coordinate all the medical approaches on the scene of a mass casualty incident. So I tried to make it very easy and put it into this framework, but I hope you can understand what I had in mind when doing this presentation, because I believe there needs to be a system and a structurized approach to get better treatment for emergency victims in mass casualty incidents. Perhaps we have to think about what kind of mass casualty incidents can we imagine? So I asked you at the beginning of the presentation, what do you have in mind if you think about a mass casualty incident? And I'm sure every one of us had one picture in his mind. I put up 9-11 in uh, the United States. But let's think about what is possible, what can we have as a mass casualty incident? Of course, I would like to start uh, top left, CBNR incidents, so chemical, biological, nuclear, radioactive uh, incidents, um, dangerous goods, we could put it together under this. So if something like this happens, doesn't matter if it's coming from a accident or a terroristic incident, uh, this is something that could cause a mass casualty incident. Of course, fire, if you have big structure fire, fire of uh, apartment buildings, of hotels, of hospitals, uh, this could lead to MCIs. Road traffic collisions, of course, this is something that happens quite often in Kenya. And if two matatus crash, you will easily have an MCI. Active shootings, it doesn't depend if uh, police officers or the military is shooting or if it is a ter terroristic incident or if it is just a shooting between uh, some rival gangs or whatever, but this could lead to more patients that then, uh, than the system is able to treat. Collapse of buildings, something that happens in Kenya more often than here in Germany, but could be intoxication. So I'm th uh, thinking about mass intoxications. Just think about uh, 
uh, carbon monoxide, for example, uh, in buildings, uh, this could lead to mass intoxications or also intoxications by food or whatever. Yeah, explosions by accident, by terroristic incident, doesn't matter. Yeah, but explosions easily can lead to MCIs. Yeah, terror incidents of all kind you can imagine, ship collisions perhaps not in Nairobi, but uh, if you go to the big lakes or if you go to uh, the Indian Ocean, if two, let's say, bigger uh, ships collide, this could lead um, to an MCI easily. So I tried to give you some impression on how difficult this MCI topic is because it covers such a wide range of things that can happen, and it is very difficult to prepare for each of them. The casualty collecting point just wanted to put things together. It is very essential for adequate treatment in case of many patients, because material that will be a restricted resource can be centralized at this point and transport prioritization and a central ambulance handover point can be implemented. So this will help um, to get things more smooth and more easy in approach. Saving of resources, of course, yeah, if you don't need to put all the medical equipment all over the scene, you can centralize it at one point, it will save your resources and also people because you don't have as many paramedics, EMTs uh, and doctors as you need it. Treatment areas will be installed for red, yellow and green patients, so we will learn more about this in the next step and um, you will have let's say some kind of intensive care treatment center for red patients and uh, low treatment center for green patients and something in between for the yellow ones. So a casualty collecting point is something very important in the structure of a management of the MCI. I just wanted to look quickly over how MCIs look in Kenya. I forgot to tell you about, I have some East Africa experience. So I've been a hospital director for the United Nations in 2015 in Mogadishu, Somalia, and have faced some things there. And also I have ties to Kenya. Um, currently I'm supporting some educational projects on emergency medicine in Kenya. We'll tell you later more about it. So. I know quite well how things are going in East Africa. And um, just recently on the 7th of April, there was this horrific accident on Melindi Coastal Road and uh, dozens have been killed. And if you look to this, a smaller Matatu has crashed into a bigger bus. And uh, even on the pictures, you see the deceased people uh, lying on the ground. But what was very impressive to me and why I, um, wanted to show you this incident is you see there is no organizational structure on scene many people running around no coordination no clear scenes so this is something where our framework i was just showing you certainly didn't work but could be implemented very well so just one kind of MCI. I took another one. This comes from 2019. Um, three people died in a building collapse in Nairobi. And again, we see the same thing. So many people on this collapsed building, perhaps they are even harming more than they bring benefit because if anybody is trapped underneath there and there are 50 people on the collapse structure, uh, this will lead to further damage and will not help the people. No structurized approach in there, no MCI approach as we mentioned. And the third one I would like to show you is a other collapse building from Nairobi. It was 2016 and um, it was simply the same as in the two last incidents I was showing to you. No really structurized approach. And you see the military then was on scene. And at least the military guys are using personal protective equipment. So they have helmets and um, things like this. But also, we have other kind of MCIs. So floodings, for example. Yeah, um, Kenya floods kill 194 people, displaced uh, tens of thousands. This is from 2020. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is something we have to prepare for too. So it's not only about the big explosions or collapse of buildings or road traffic accidents. Good. 
I would like to come to the next point now, and this is what we wanted to talk about today, so triage, pre-hospital triage at mass casualty incidents. And I did some kind of research and I found out there is even more than 20 different triage systems for pre-hospital triage. And I put them all here on the uh, slide and three of them are marked red because I would like to introduce you further to this three because I believe they are really relevant and you should know them. So it's start, mstart and salt. This three uh, algorithms for mass casualty pre-hospital triage we would like to talk about further but you see there are many different systems all over the world and um, some of them have been checked on a scientific base, but many of them haven't. So we don't even know if they are working well or not. Um, what are the intentions of pre-hospital triage at mass casualty incidents? We would like to separate patients into categories of urgency. So as I said on my first slide, we would like to pick out the red ones to treat them first. This is really necessary. We need to find the most critical patients fast to save their lives. Just one second. <laughs> yes, um, working from home clearly has its challenges. Hi, Florian. <laughs> I'm back. I'm very sorry. It was my turn. work. Hi. So um, to continue, we need to find the most critical patients fast to save their lives because they will need life-saving interventions immediately. We need to keep resources free for critical cases and we don't want them to be overloaded with, for example, green patients. If you have a patient that just has a very short cut in the hand, I mean, this is something that can be treated by every doctor in every clinic. He doesn't need to go to the big trauma center, but if you will send 10 of them to a big trauma center, they will be busy and they won't be able to treat the critical patients. And it is a tool to find out who can be treated on scene or whose treatment can be delayed without severe consequences. So as I mentioned, the one with a cut in his hand, of course, this is not nice, but it won't kill him in the next 12 hours. So his treatment could be delayed so that others can be saved that need necessary treatment right on scene or very fast. Let's take a look to triage categories. Um, there is this triage category scheme that is used widely all over the world. And we can put it into different numbers of categorization. So one, two, three, or four. And we can use the colors. And the colors, they are also widely recognized all over the world. I would like to start with the most critical patients. It's triage category one. It's the red patients. The red are the most severe injured or ill patients. The meaning of color red or triage category one is acute life threat. So if we don't do interventions right now, this patient will die. It needs immediate treatment, immediate transport. And for example, this is a massive bleeding situation, uh, obstructed airway, things like this could be triage category one. How we can put the patients into this triage category, I will show on the next slides. Triage category two, so the yellow ones, they are seriously ill or injured, but without a acute threat to life. They need urgent treatment. It shouldn't be delayed too much but um, the transportation can go to the priority. So regarding their priority and operation indication. So if they need um, treatment at the operation theater, they should be uh, transported first. If not, they can be delayed a little bit. I have some examples for this, for example, traumatic brain injury, of course, only if the patient is still conscious and breathing well, um, otherwise he would be a red patient. Um, uh, complex trauma situations, yeah, uh, things like this could be yellow patients. Let's look to the green ones. So triage category three, minor injuries or illnesses. As I mentioned, the one that cut himself into the hand, that's not urgent for treatment and 
perhaps they don't even need transport capacity because perhaps this can be treated on scene. Yeah? So we don't need to send them to the hospital to block capacity in there and we don't need to block transport capacity things like closed fractures of course they will need treatment not on scene but at the hospital but a smaller kind of things this is green patients then we have the blue patients it's triage category four and they are without hope of survival yeah um, the treatment is hopeless possibly they can get palliative care so uh, pain relief on scene but this can't be given clear examples because it depends on the situation yeah if you have good resources perhaps someone will be category red and not blue but if you have limited resources some people might be hopeless yellow means uh, sorry not yellow white is simply not triaged yet and the black ones they are deceased so if they're is a severe impact that they can't survive this and you can't put them red because there is no time for CPR in the settings. So they will be simply black, they are deceased. Um, the treatment is the appro approval of death by a physician. This can be done later. So you will just put them to a central place in the casualty collecting point and uh, collect all the deceased people and um, there will be no transportation you will hand over this patients to law enforcement for this so no cpr in mass casualty incidents this is something we can remember because it will bring so many resources just on one patient that you will need for many others so there is no benefit from it we shouldn't do this let us take a look now over Sub-Sahara Africa. I have this from the same World Health uh, Organization publication as cited before. Um, they were reviewing some countries in Sub-Sahara Africa, and I can't tell you clearly why Kenya is not in there. So um, they simply spared the Horn of Africa, why ever, yeah? Um, but if you look to the blue marked countries in there, then there is a EMS provider triage out of hospital triage protocol in place. So they have some kind of national approach. But for example, as you see, Uganda, they are blue. But I was talking to colleagues in Uganda before I started this presentation here, and they were telling me, yes, of course, there is some kind of national plan, but it's not implemented. So it doesn't work either, but at least they have a plan. Yeah? If we look to the green ones, then we have national protocols on out hospital trash. And if we look to the red ones, we see that there is a lack of a formal algorithm of first care delivery in case of mass casualty incidents. So this is what we are facing in Kenya right now too. There is no national unified approach to mass casualty incidents that is implemented by the health authorities. Let's look to triage concepts now. And I would like to start with <laughs> the START triage simple. START stands for simple triage and rapid treatment. So this is the intention. It is easy to triage patients and then get a rapid treatment in case of severe life threat. This is what they would like to have. Um, START triage shows a system that has been developed with the help of the World Health Organization. Um, they implemented it and it is uh, first published, I think, 1998. So this is uh, the start of the START triage system. Um, all walking patients are always green in their system. So they are category three, they are minor. And if we look to this algorithm now, you will see one, let's say severe problem of this algorithm because you will always need to check the recap time, the recapillarization, so the perfusion of this patients by recap. And what is the uh, problem in this? If you think about darkness, it doesn't even have to be at night, but also inside buildings or whatever. If you don't have sufficient light with you, this recapillarization time could be very difficult to find out. Um, 
And this is one of the biggest problems we have with START. But START is something that has been implemented in many, in many countries around the world. So this is not uh, something that is only for one or two countries, but it's very popular in the United States, in UK, um, over Europe, um, in Asia. So START is something really many people are using for triage. It has been validated in many, many research studies. Um, there had been a look, can uh, trained uh, first aiders do this? How is the quality to find out the critical patients if medical professionals do it? How is it if doctors do it? And the overall thing is that, sorry, um, you don't need to be a medical professional to use this algorithm or checklist because it's very easy to do. If you are trained in a one hour session, you will be, you will be able to do it. Um, it is quite sensitive to find out the critical patients, but there is some kind of over triage in this system. You will always have over triage, but it's okay. So start is something you can use and the whole world is using. Let's look to the next step now because this is m start so it bases on the start algorithm but it's a modified simple triage and rapid treatment approach what is m start coming from we had a group of physicians here in munich and they were thinking about how would it be possible to optimize the start algorithm and this is what came out so m start is coming from here and um what is the difference? It's still the same algorithm, but we, we, we were able to replace the capillary refill time. So this has totally gone out and made it more safe to use. So it's a modified start algorithm. It has better sensitivity to detect the red patients as the start algorithm has, and there is no capillary refill check, so no difficulty in the darkness. Another system, and this is the one Benjamin, I believe, uh, likes, is SALT triage. So SALT stands for SALT Access, uh, Access, sorry, Life-Saving Intervention Treatment Transport. So SALT triage is something um, you could also do. And um, if we compare the normal START algorithm to SALT triage, um, you can find out why the source preference among females and physician assistant students was based on the additional of medical interventions and provision of palliative care. Start's preference was related to expendency. So there is no clear evidence for one or the other. I believe you need to find the algorithm that fits to your system well and this must be the step it doesn't depend on if you use start m start or sold or whatever it needs to be implemented i will talk about this on a later slide so all these algorithms or triage concepts are let's say nearly the same because it's always comes to the same essence if patients can walk around they are always not critical so this is something that is in common in all these algorithms and that you can keep in mind. And just the, the differentiation between the yellow and the red ones is sometimes different. Let's look to a conclusion for the triage concepts. Is there a clear evidence for a single triage system? No, there isn't. There are some with better sensitivity, some with less. Some with but there is not, there is not one system that is the best. A triage tool, as I said before, must fit the local needs. So it must be adapted to what you have on scene there. It must be trained and known by everyone in the EMS setting. So it doesn't depend if it's only the ambulance driver, it's if it's the EMR, EMT, paramedic, the emergency physician, all need to be trained and all need to know the system there must be some kind of patient documentation available. Hospitals will need to be involved in the whole process of planning and implementing such a system. And there isn't one size fits all in this question. So there is not the one system that is figuring out all your problems, but you will need to adapt it to your local needs. So, 
How can it be done, a triage approach? We need a unified system that is implemented all over the region, yeah? perhaps countywide, but at the best thing would be if we would do it nationwide. Here in Germany, we didn't do it nationwide because we have federal member states here and it's never possible to get all these federal member states together. It's just 14 uh, right now, but uh, they are all doing their own businesses. So what we have here in Bavaria, my federal member state is, we have a system for the federal member states. So it's 36 counties here in our federal member state. And of course, they are much smaller than counties are in Kenya usually, um, but all over Bavaria, we have the same triage system. Every ambulance crew needs to be trained in triage for mass casualty incidents. And this doesn't mean that we will do a training tomorrow and the next five years, we will never talk about it again. So this is something that needs to be repeated and repeated and repeated because things, we know this very well from research, things that we don't do often in medicine will only be at an adequate level of care provided if we train them. So it's necessary to train them on a regular basis. Every ambulance needs to be equipped with triage materials and each patient identification card needs to be registered. So I, sh uh, I uh, would like to show you this patient registration card here. This is a German model. Um, you have this uh, scan code on and also there is HER slash 0951. So each patient identification card has a unique code so that you can always trace and track the patients later on. So if the first ambulance arrives on scene and puts a patient registration card on each patient, yeah, you will later be able to track this patients and to look for the complete way from the scene of the emergency to the hospital and for further information of relatives, for example. Um, you need clear identification of triage teams. So for example, triage Wests, we use this model here in Bavaria. So the ambulance crew, if they arrive on scene and they start with the triage, they will put over this West over their normal personal protective clothing and if later other units arrive on scene, they will be able to identify them directly and see, ah, look, there is a triage team, they are working already. And we have identification light. Perhaps you know this nicking light, you can activate and they will wear this one in case of darkness. <clears throat> You need sufficient equipment for triage teams. So you need documentation and registration equipment. As I showed you earlier, um, this patient documentation cards, for example, you need tourniquets or emergency bandages or at best both. And you need OPAs and NPAs. So oropharyngeal um, airway devices and nasopharyngeal airway devices to clear the airway. How can this look like? These are models we are using here in Germany. These are triage or registration bags. What is the content? We have the patient identification cards as shown earlier. We have a patient registration list. So every time you will give out one of your cards, you will register it on your list and you, it is pre-arranged. So all the numbers are on the list already. So you just need to tick it, uh, will go very fast. You have a clip board to write on, you have markers and pens, you have turning keys to stop life-threatening bleeding because this is what is in the algorithm. You have emergency bandages also for severe bleeding, you have NPAs and OPAs, and we have red and black, black tape on because for the red patients, we not only use the patient ID card with the color code in there, but we also use a red tape. We wrap around the arm of the patient so that they can be identified more easily. And the black tape, as you can imagine, is for the black patients. So for the deceased ones, um, you will just wrap this around them and everyone will see, okay, I don't need to have a look in there again. They are dead. Um, Conclusions from the scene. What do we have to do to save lives, no matter which algorithm we are using? We need to identify the red patients, the most critical. We need to perform life-saving interventions for those with potential. So we need to stop critical bleedings and clear the airways. These are the only things we are doing in the first step of a mass casualty incident. So no opening of IV lines, no medication, not all this stuff. So during triage, only stop critical bleedings, clear airways. 
we need to get treatment for the yellows in time because as I mentioned, for example, there is a traumatic brain injury patient in there. They, be, they need treatment in time. Yeah? And we need to separate the green ones because they can easily be delayed. This won't make a difference in the outcomes. What can the future bring? I would just like to give you a brief introduction to this. Um, this is Rescue Wave, a system that has been invented here in Germany. It's a digital patient documentation device. So you won't have patient ID cards anymore if you use this system, but you have just this transmitter and you will just hang it around the neck of the patient. It has a own radio network and GPS locationing device. So you can later see on a map where your patients are exactly. It's very funny. Um, it's easy for triage documentation because you just need to switch it to the color you want it. So you have, um, you can see that you can switch from red to yellow to green. And um, it is visible at day and night because it has an own uh, light. Also, you can easily mark the transport priority. Um, so this is a system that can work very well, um, is implemented in Germany here in some counties. Uh, you will have digital documentation if you use this. So you have a complete situational overview. As I told you by the GPS mapping on a map, you can see where the patients exactly are on scene or later at the hospitals. You can do transport organization with some clicks. So you can do it all digitally and you will always be ahead of the situation. So this is something that the future could bring. Also a digital bed management system like we use here in Germany, Ivina, for example. So the central EMS call and dispatch center has a central di digital bed management system. So they will know at any time what hospital resources and capacities are free. Yeah? So hospitals can log into this portal and they can deactivate their things. For example, if they don't have an ICU bed, they will just click it to red and the EMS call and dispatch center will directly know it. And they will tell the ambulance, no, don't go to this hospital, to go to another one because there are resources free. Um, this has big benefits in case of a mass casualty incident. It is very good for the normal service use as well. So this is something that is really necessary and should be implemented. And there are many different software applications available at low prices. So there are also MCI management apps for the use with smartphones. They're easily accessible, small budget things. There are many things on the market. Uh, could be an option too in the future. I'm slightly over time, so I would like to come to my recommendations for Kenya now. Um, I have this step approach and I would like to start at the bottom. So there needs to be a decision for a unified triage system for each county, better a nationwide system. If this decision has been made, there needs to be the implementation and teaching of this triage system at county levels for everyone. The complete EMS system, fire brigades, if available, hospitals. Yeah? There needs to be the equipping of every ambulance in the country with a triage bag. Also, there needs to be the implementation of an EMS command structure to reduce the chaos in terms of mass casualty incidents. And there needs to be the implementation of a mass casualty incident training with national standards. So all learn the same. Implementation of digital approaches such as bad management systems could be a further step to help improve the situation and to help to improve the response to such incidents. I would like to introduce you to my own educational platform. So it's not my own, but we are doing it as a team. So East African Emergency Update, you can follow us on Facebook. Um, there are talks like this um, twice a month and you will get a digital input. Uh, so as Benjamin is doing this, so I would like to give this to you um, just to take a look over it. And I would like to thank you for your audience now because this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And back to you, Benjamin. Um, all right, thank you very much, Florian. Um, I think we'll kick off with um, questions, comments, suggestions, inputs from that presentation before we uh, give you a chance to actually cheer some real life patients um, through the polling function of this uh, uh, Zoom. So any questions, comments? Uh, again, feel free to just put up your hand and uh, 
maybe raise up your hand or in the chat uh you feel you are welcome to unmute yourself and maybe just ask your question so feel free any questions from the presentation hello benjamin hello Tom. hi paul how are you fine thank you uh, mine mine is based on the last uh, recommendations for Kenya. Um, and I was wondering how far are we into implementing these recommendations because they, they seem very good and workable. How far are we according to your you know, knowledge of the situation in Kenya? Uh, anyone before I hazard a, a response to that, those working in the pre-hospital setting, how far are we on that one? So from my structuralized research I did, in, uh, before starting this presentation, I can tell you um, there is no nationwide or countywide approach all over Kenya. We have some counties that have implemented some kind of algorithms, but uh, there is no unified algorithm for Kenya so far. And furthermore, the equipping of ambulances with triage bags and triage equipment is something that is very at the beginning right now. So um, we have some providers that have something, but for example, I spoke to E plus and they don't have it overall for the whole each, uh, agency. All right, uh, anyone again, uh, pre-hospital, what are you, uh, do you have triage systems, the ones working in ambulance services here in Kenya? Do you have any specific mass casualty triage system in your uh, ambulance services? Again, just feel free to unmute and comment. I know a lot of you work in the EMS system. The silence would mean there's nothing that exists. Uh, Brian, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, I think my question would actually be more to you, Benjamin. Yes. Because, um, this is a very good initiative that you began and I've been following all along, you know, right from the beginning. Yes. Would it be possible to include the policy makers, the decision makers, let's say in government, whether national government or county government, so that uh, whatever, uh, you know, recommendations come out of these sessions can actually be implemented because you know very well, we have beautiful policies, but our problem comes in the implementation. So, you know, to avoid a situation where we, we just keep talking with no action, what do you have to say about that? All right. So I'll start with Paul's comment, uh, then I'll get yours, Brian, because Paul, uh, so uh, where are we in terms of implementing these recommendations? Um, so at the moment, most of the work um, has been around development of the policies that uh, have been in place. I know there's an EMS policy that's in the works, so EMS bill. Uh, there's an emergency medical care policy that came out last year. In terms of standardizing EMS at the moment, um, then the possibility of this happening is still very far off, if I could say at best um and potentially may not be a direction that we will go to anytime soon what is happening at the moment is counties are actually investing in ems systems and building ems systems at county level which is really good uh what is lacking potentially and where we are working with the counties to now develop sops is support the counties to come up with standardized protocols uh, for their ambulance services. And this will be very much county driven as an initial phase versus a national kind of system yet. Um, but uh, what we are hoping for is as we work with the individual counties. So in the, to just uh, go into Brian's question, policymakers are engaged. Um, we have a lot of meetings with uh, chief officers, county directors, uh, CECs of health, and a lot of them, at least in the few countries that we've been working with, at least this year, many of them understand the challenges and uh, the challenge, most of them, the issue actually that they don't really understand is the solutions. Um, so I think we've not gone to a county where they do not understand the challenges. 
But what has been lacking, and again, I'll throw this back to all the experts in this discussion, is they don't know where to get the solutions and are left to the mercy of uh, whoever is available. And of course, there's also the scrupulous people who try to take advantage of the system. So most counties, and I think if you are in a county and um, you're an expert in EMS, you should actually just ask for a meeting with your county director of medical services or your chief officer of health and just go and have a, just a chat about EMS. Most of them don't know where to get help from in terms of support to build their systems. Uh, some already have engaged uh, experts. Uh, and uh, if you look at in these situations, the EMS services are starting to thrive. Uh, and But it's a long-term process. Mm -hmm. So we are, it's not national, but at county level, there's some, a lot of work going on. Yes, I hope that helps with that discussion. Isaac Barasa, go ahead. Just before Isaac is answering, I would just like to add something to this because uh, as uh, the speaker mentioned before, the implementation is always the, the problem in Kenya. And we have noticed many times that there is a problem from coming to vision, uh, from visions to missions, yeah, to put the things in place. And I often see that the problem is people don't even know what is possible. So they have never seen a system of a implemented pre-hospital MCI tool, for example. And if you have never seen something like this or, or never heard about it, it is difficult to just imagine how it could work in your own county. And this is where all the listeners of this uh, presentation today could really step up and bring it into the field to transfer these ideas to their county level responsible people and just to activate them. Because if somebody is activated, he can do research on his own and learn more about it and then get interested into implementing something that is really necessary. Uh, Isaac? Uh, your hand was up, you can unmute yourself. Okay, uh, so there are some comments on the chat which you can quickly get through. Uh, what happens for without hope of survival? Unfortunately, in any the, the purpose of any triage system um, is to do the most for the most. And uh, where there's a patient who has very little hope for survival and required a lot of resources to keep them alive, then most of the time, unfortunately, the resources will be prioritized to those where we can provide immediate help. And if resources allow and time allows and the patient is still alive, then the potential would get to those people who have very little hope of survival. But majority of the time, they are the last people to be dealt with. Uh, cost of triage yes. back. Um, so I think one of the things I'd like to potentially summarize from Florian's discussion is mm -hmm. triage is, uh, so we're going to go still into in-hospital triage, but this is now more around just pre-hospital triage. The issue about triage is, as Florian was mentioning, it's not about what system you use. The most important part is you must have a system as a starting point. And the system must be able to prioritize the very sick patients uh, who need immediate help and down and come down as to the ones with uh, who need less amount of help. The, se the second most important thing about any triage system is must be known by everyone using the system, and must be able, you must be able to replicate it. So, uh, one person triaging a patient red in your service the other person coming to triage the same patient should more or less come to the same conclusion this is a red patient or this is a green patient, this is a yellow patient. So the height has to be standardized and everyone must know the, the triage system. Um, I think the other third most important part is, apart from it first having a system, having it documented, everyone in the system, then there has to be a clear way of identifying the patient that after they've been triaged. So whether you're going to paint their face red, preferably not, uh, or whether you're going to put some fancy gadget on them, or whether you're going to stick a piece of paper, it should be easy for someone to identify that that patient has been triaged red. So whether you can use, but and again, you need to use something that will not of course rub off or come off or get caught off so that 
as the patient moves through the system or someone else comes along, they should be able to say, that patient has a yellow tag. And it can be a simple thing as tying a yellow band on patient's hands, uh, if you have some nice paint or something, putting a red on their forehead or something. So people must be able to identify how a patient was triaged, okay? Um, so it's not about having any fancy gadgetry, buying, I'm seeing someone talking about buying a triage bag and printing papers. Yes, if you have the resources, that would make a lot of sense. But the main thing is, when you go to the field, how do you identify that? How do you, you triage a patient to say this patient is yellow? What marker shall you put on that patient that will allow you to say, this is a yellow patient, and everyone else walking around and everyone else moving around will be able to say, this is a yellow patient. Um, Let's see, uh, I'm seeing something about uh, how prepared are hospitals in handling emergencies. One, or most, uh, one, most counties lack the adequate required officers in handling emergencies. Two, most uh, lack the equipment to handle emergencies. We need to do more in terms of emergencies. I totally agree with that comment and we'll discuss more. That's from Yusuf Adam. We'll discuss more about in-hospital triage. Isaac, I see your mic is unmuted. Do you want to ask your question? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, and so with these policies being written, I let's just mute. With these policies being written, and there are there trainings on the same, and so everyone is on the same wavelength? Yes. And this can be whatever policies come you come up with. So policies could be at a national level. Policies could be at a facility level. Um, and you should be able to have this triage process or these policies known and trained within the facilities. All right, uh, I think Paul likes the permanent paint one. Yes, so uh, the main thing is how do we identify patients? So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna, let me see if I can do a couple of things. So we're gonna triage some patients. So what you're seeing in front of you is the scenario. Uh, is the triage, the salt triage, she said, uh, yes, Florian, I heard you say only women like this one. It's fine, <laughs> yes. Um, but again, the important part of it, again, it's not the triage system that you use, but you just have to have a system. Most of them, pretty much, the red patient needs immediate care, yellow patient should be the next in line, green patients are the last ones to be dealt with, well, the second last ones to be dealt with. So dead can be, depends on which system you're using, like in this one, dead is white, I've been in situations where the dead color is black, I've been in situations where the dead color is blue. So um, it just depends what system you're using, okay? Expectant are those, as you can see, people who are less likely to survive and where if your resources are available, then you can come to them. So I think Florian already went through this triage system um, and we'll go through some case scenarios. Let's see how this works. Um, so launching poll. All right, so you should be able to see on your screen um, a poll uh, with different questions. And uh, again, you can just use your phone to tick on the correct answer. Um, I don't know, uh, are you able to see both the questions and the triage system? You can't answer it, Benjamin. So you see the questions, but it's already uh, the conclusion from it, so you can't click it. Oh, okay. I know viewing the questions. Ah, interesting. Uh, so you cannot click on the question. You cannot uh, pull no, on no, it. No, no. Oh, interesting. That's a go. But uh, oops, yes. So, uh, Benjamin. Yes. Look, I'm actually able to do the poll. Oh, you're able to do the poll on your the end? Choices. Yeah, yeah, it's able to. Okay, go ahead then. Uh, for those who can, I think it depends on what system you're using. Uh, so, perhaps it's because I'm the host, that's why I can't see it. Oh, yes, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Me too, I was wondering why I can't. All right, so number one question. So a truck driver walks in, uh, this is uh, in your casualties, uh, it's a, it's a pre-hospital system. All of this is a pre-hospital system. So a truck driver walks in complaining of neck and shoulder pain, 
uh, his elderly, history of cardiac illness, suspensions under 30, pulse is present, uh, mental status alert and oriented. So is he a red, yellow, green, black, white, or yes? Okay. So um, you able, are you able to just click on the correct one? Are people able to click, by the way? Because I'm not seeing any act any activity on this end. So is he alive? I'm trying to, is he red, green, or yellow? Uh, Marion, are you able to vote? Moment. Yes, I'm voting very well. I'm on number four. Hey, okay, slow down. Yes, anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, number two is a minibus driver. Blood is coming from the ears, facial fractures, skull laceration, he's unconscious, his respiratory rate is under 30. When you feel for his pulse, he has no radial pulse, and he's uh, currently unconscious. Question number three, minibus passenger, major skull fracture with eye socket hanging out. Uh, wow. Uh, respiratory. <laughs> he's not breathing after head tilt. There's no radio pulse. He's unconscious. All right. Number four. Uh, impaled one foot of uh, shrapnel in the right eye. One foot piece of shrapnel in the right eye. He's breathing under 30. Uh, pulse is present in the radial. His GCS is awake and oriented. Wow. Okay. Um, number five is a minibus passenger. Child weighs from the back seat with the seat belt on. Answers questions but whimpers. Uh, respiratory under 30. Pulse is radial. Pulse is present. Mental status is awake and oriented. Number six, compound fracture of the left femur, respirations under 30, pulse is, uh, radial is absent, mental status is alert and oriented. Number seven, 90% second degree burns over body, respirations is gasping after head tilt, pulse radial is present, but 3D mental status is unconscious. Interesting one. Uh -huh. uh, number eight, patient states he, she's a diabetic, skin is moist and clammy, expressions under 30, pulse radial is absent, mental status, patient is alert. Uh, number nine, medibus passenger uh, who was an infant, properly restrained in the car, she's on the seat. Crying and whimpering reaches out to you. Respirations under 30 present, a little pulse present, mental status awake and oriented. And the final one is patients unable to move the legs. Respirations under 30, pulse radial is present, uh, mental status patient is confused. All right, submit your votes in the next. Uh, I'm seeing good, everyone is submitting. Good, good. A few more before I end the polling. All right, we'll give you a minute. We've got 41% people voted, 43%. Okay, submit. Then we we'll quickly go through the answers and see how that looks like. All right. One more minute. Go through and submit your responses. Good. All right. All right, almost done. Okay, 55%. Let's finish off on the voting, then we can uh, go through the answers.
All right, as the camera goes on. All right, I think majority already have already submitted the responses. So I'll we'll end the poll. All right, let's have a look. Aha, uh -huh, let's share the results. All right, uh, you should be able to see the answers. All right. So let's go through first question. Again, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, comment. And so a truck driver who is walking. All right, so that should be the first clue. The patient's already walking. So if he's walking, then that becomes, uh, if you're looking at the salt triage or any triage system actually, someone who's already walking then is a green automatically. All right, um, that puts them at green. All right, second question. Minima, minibus driver, uh, blood from the ears, uh, facial fracture, skull laceration, patient is unconscious, so they're not moving. Um, so if you go down the triage system, so key thing is you need to control major hemorrhage, so he's not walking, so he's not uh, green. Uh, the next thing is uh, assess individual assessment, perform any life-saving interventions, uh, is he breathing? Uh, yes, he's breathing. Respirations are under 30. So if he's breathing, that answer is yes. Uh, is he obeying commands? Uh, for sure, he's unconscious. He's not uh, obeying any commands. So the answer is no. And then is he likely to survive uh, given the current resources? Yes. So he's a red. All right. So congratulations to those uh, who wants it red. Question three. Uh, three, minibus passenger. Major skull fracture with eye socket hanging out. Uh, respiratory, none after head tilt, pulse radial null, mental. So this patient is actually dead. All right, uh, which is correct. Question four. Oh, this was interesting. Uh, the answers varied. Um, impaled one foot of shrapnel in right eye. Uh, respirations under 30. Uh, pulse rate and uh, pulse rate is present. Me mental status is awake and oriented. All right. Uh, so is he red or yellow? Anyone who wants to tackle this one? So I'm guessing with one foot piece of shrapnel in his right eye, he, uh, is he walking? We don't know. All right, so we'll assume he's not walking because we don't have that information. Is he breathing? Yes, he's breathing. Uh, he's able, to, he's awake and oriented, so he's able to obey commands, has peripheral pulse. Uh, he's respiratory under touch, not major respiratory distress. Uh, he has a something impaled, okay, uh, in his head, but there's no evidence of major bleeding. So he has yes on this. So is he minor injuries? No. I think something that's stuck inside his right eye is not really, would not be considered a minor injury. So then he becomes a yellow. So the guys once said yellow, definitely correct. All right, let's go number five. Child waves from the back seat to the seat belt to all answers all questions by wind pulse, uh, respirate uh, under 30, pulse rate present, mental status awake and oriented. Yes, definitely is a green because there are no major injuries. The patient is awake oriented and uh, obeying commands. So uh, this was a nice one where there was quite a bit of a tussle between red and yellow. Uh, compound fracture on the left femur, respirations under 30, pulse radial absent. Okay, uh, so the patient has no radial pulse. Mental status is awake and oriented. All right, uh, anyone wants to give uh is it a red or is it a yellow so is he breathing yes he's breathing uh no major hemorrhage happening uh no respiratory distress uh does he have a peripheral pulse no he has no radial pulse so if it's no 
Uh, if is he likely to survive given the current resources? Yes. So he's a red patient. Okay, because he's actually in shock uh, with the absence of the idle pulse, give or take. All right, so the answer, the red answers win. Okay, so good on that one. And then number seven, 90% uh, second degree burns of a body. Uh, respirations gasping after head chilled. Pulse radial present but thready. Mental status unconscious. So is he breathing? Uh, not necessarily, yeah, I mean, gasping after head tilt, so that doesn't necessarily count as breathing. Um, so, but, okay, he still he still has some breast effort, so you can give him yes, he's breathing. But, uh, obeys commands, no. Is he likely to survive? This is, where, this is where actually a good question. I don't know, anyone wants to comment. Is this patient likely to survive in Kenya given the current resources? Yes, no, maybe. Anyone wants to comment? Again, feel free to unmute and just give your opinion. Unlikely with the 90%. Yeah. 90% burns unlikely. Yes. So 90, so he's not dead. That's, a pro, that's actually the tricky part here. Because you can't say he's dead because he has a pulse. And uh, he's gasping. So, but he's unlikely. So that's a group that is called expectant. And this is where the group that you may come to deal with if um, you finish all the red, yellow, and uh, you potentially have additional resources and you want to deal with this one. All right, number eight, a patient states she's diabetic, skin is moist and clammy, respiration is under 30, radial pulse is absent, patient is alert. Okay, so has a peripheral pulse? The answer is no. Uh, Likely to survive? Yes. Uh, so she's actually becomes a red patient, uh, not actually a yellow, interesting enough, because of the absence of her radial pulse. Yes. And number nine, a uh, minibus passenger infant uh, properly restrained in a car seat, crying, whimpering, reaches out to you, respiration is under 30, pulse rate is present, awake, alert, oriented. Yes, definitely a green patient. All right, and uh, final question on this round. Unable to move legs, so it's definitely not working. Is he breathing? Yes, under 30. Uh, he has a radial pulse, is present. Uh, mental status patient is confused. So obeys commands and make purposeful movements? Uh, no. Uh, so the answer would be no. Is he likely to survive? Yes. So he's actually a red, not a yellow, okay? Though, yes, it's actually a red, not a uh, yellow on this patient. All right, good. All right. Uh, good first round. So we have one more round of pre-hospital, and then uh, we will be going into the ED triage. So this is all pre-hospital, then we'll switch quickly to the ED triage. All right, so launching the second one. So you 10 more questions. Uh, we've had the first round, so this one, uh, you should all get all the right questions. All right, so you should be seeing the questions now. Feel free to start answering the questions, and then we should be able to, so we just quickly go through the questions. Amputated left arm, bleeding controlled, uh, respirations under 30, pulse rate, pre uh, radial pulse present, mental status awake and oriented. Question two. No apparent injuries, respiration is under 30, radial pulse present, patient is alert. Question three, sucking chest wound, respiration is under 30, uh, pulse radial is present, mental status is unconscious. Oh, sorry, pulse is over 30. No, respiration is over 30, pulse present. Uh, question four, dislocated right shoulder, uh, respirations under 30, pulse radial present, mental status, patient is alert. Question five, no visible wounds, respirations after head tilt, chin lift, none, pulse radial absent, mental status unconscious. Question six, large head wound, brain matter showing, wow, respiratory, respirations less than 30, uh, absent radial pulse, uh, mental status unconscious. 
Question seven, uh, eight year old, old male with both feet crushed, breathing once every three seconds, okay. Uh, knows name, date, what happened, brachial pulse at the rate of 45 beats in 30 seconds. Interesting. Uh, number eight, uh, truck passenger walks in, upset but no apparent complaints, elderly man, respirations under 30, pulse present, mental status awake and oriented. Scalp wound with an estimated blood loss of 500 ml, respirations over 30, pulse radial present, mental status confused. And final question, female, six months pregnant, broken left lower leg, uh, respirations under 30, pulse radial present, mental status awake and oriented. All right, good. Uh, once you've answered all the questions, submit your polls. A good uh, lot of voting happening. Great stuff. Then you can quickly go through the answers. Nice. Good job on the voting. Good, good. Submit your answers. All right. All right. Paul, I see your hand is up. You have a question? Uh, yes. Uh about the previous poll, when it comes to kids, I was just a bit concerned because they are unable to really express how they feel. Uh -huh. um, I have a problem uh, tagging them green, especially in a significant uh, crash uh, situation. Sorry, sorry, I didn't get that one. Uh, you're saying the problem for, is? For children. For oh, children. Yes. For, uh -huh. Yeah. In a, if, if they are in a MCI scenario, yes. even though they are awake, I yes. would have a problem with really, you know, tagging them green, um, yes. especially if they are whimpering. Um, we they are not able to really express, uh, you know, uh, you know, some of the they might be hiding some of the injuries. Uh, maybe a further assessment. Maybe a yellow would be better for the kids. Okay, but again, the question would be. Uh, so it depends, of course, on the age of the child. Um, if a child is injured, for sure they'll be crying un un uncontrollably. If uh, as the patient, if the child, it's more about how the reaction of the child to stimulus. So are they recognizing the mother? Are they comfortable? So such kind of responses that would because that's how you'd uh, assess a child. But there's also a jump start. Jump start is for is for pediatrics. Uh, I think it's the only one. I don't know, Florian. Any other pre-hospital triage system that's. Uh, um that's specific to pediatrics. I only know Jumpstart. Jumpstart is the only one that has been validated for children so far. Um, we are actually using MStart here for adults and children. It's working so far because if you over triage children in case of an MCI that is related with many pediatric patients, just imagine, for example, a road traffic collision with a school bus, you will have 20, 30 children, and if you all triage them higher than they are, you will limit your own resources again. So you should follow the algorithms. Which one you use doesn't matter at all, uh, but you should follow them again because otherwise the critical ones will get delayed treatment again. Um, so if we follow SALT, we can take a look again. Control major hemorrhage. I mean, this is the same in children and adults. There is no difference. Yeah. Um, if we need to open the airway, okay, this uh, the same. Um, is the patient breathing? This is the same with children. And if they are crying, they will be breathing for sure. Yeah. Um, can they obey commands? This is easy. Like even if they are crying, and if you pull their hand or uh, squeeze their hand, and if they try to pull it away, this is like 
obey commands. This is simply the same. So you can do it this way. Um, peripheral pulls, you can do this with, with children too. Uh, if there is respiratory distress, you will see it because they might get blue by cyanosis even faster than adults do. And if the hemorrhage is controlled, this part can be followed. And you can differentiate if the injuries are minor or major. So you can use salt on pediatric patients too. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Floriana. Yes, I agree with that. So the main thing, remember, Paul, and I think the discussion around what we are talking about is the key thing is to be able to have a system that is reproducible. So uh, the thing about triage, it cannot be subjective. It has to be very objective. And yes, there are potential chances where you will over triage a patient, uh, which then you risk uh, uh, crowding your resources. Uh, overwhelming resources or you can under triage patients and people die so it's a very tricky but it has to be reproducible and also i think one of the things that i also maybe would want to summarize is triage is a dynamic process so you don't triage a patient once and say we are done okay the patient again gets retriaged so because patients get better patients deteriorate so someone could have been triaged green but then they get worse, so they're brought back to being a yellow or get worse and brought back to being a red. So triage is a dynamic process. So it's not a one shot screenshot kind of scenario. Patients have to be retriaged periodically. All right, so thank you for the question, Paul. All right, let's look at the answers to the questions. Okay, so question one, amputated left arm, bleeding is controlled, respirations under 30. Patient is mental status awake and oriented. Um, so these are not minor injuries. The patient would actually be uh, yellow. So the patient is awake oriented, so they are doing commands. They have a pulse in the radial pulse. They are not in respiratory distress. And uh, the hemorrhage seems to be controlled. So, and it's a major injury, not a minor injury. So it's a yellow patient. Good. Next question is no apparent injuries, expressions under 30, pulse rate of present, alert. Again, that would be a green. Uh, number three, sucking chest wound, which needs to be addressed more or less immediately. Uh, respirations over 30, so they're quite tachypneic, so they're in respiratory distress. Uh, pulse radial is present, mental status unconscious. Yes, uh, this is a patient who would fall and uh, um, a red patient, yes, that's correctly done. Um, dislocated right shoulder, respirations under 30, pulse radial present, uh, mental status alert. Okay, so um, so all of the, he takes all the box, obeys commands, peripheral pulse is present, not in respiratory distress, hemo there is no actual hemorrhage. Uh, dislocated shoulder, I would agree with the people who say this is a green. It's a minor injury that can be quickly addressed. Okay, so that would be a green patient. Um, number five, no visible wounds. Respirations after head chill, chin lift, none. Mental status, uh, every, pretty much is a dead patient. Yes, okay. Um, so they would be classified as dead. Large head wound, yeah, brain matter showing, okay. Now, I, it's a tricky part because if your brain matter is showing, you'd want to say they're dead. But unfortunately, this patient still has some respirations. So you can't classify them as dead. And that's why, but they are unlikely to survive. So that's why they end up being classified as expectant. Okay, and sort of patient you'd be dealing with, actual, actually, they are, this one would be allowed uh, comfort care down the line. Number seven, an eight-year-old male with both feet crushed, breathing once every three seconds. Um, so that would be what, 12 breaths per minute? No, sorry, 10 breaths. No, 20 breaths. That's 20 breaths per minute. Uh, nose, name, date, what happened? Brachial pulse is present at a rate of 45 beats in 30 seconds, which is 90 beats per minute. So, um, are they obeying commands? Yes. Do they have a peripheral pulse? Yes. Uh, are they in respiratory distress? Potentially. They're breathing uh, 20 breaths per minute. Cut off is 30. Uh, major hemorrhage controlled. He has both crashed feet, so 
that would be a lot of people say dread why any specific reasons why you think it should be a red and not a yellow benjamin i can't see the screen what number is that number seven. Oh, sorry wait 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 okay so you share results there you should be able to see it now yes number seven Red versus yellow. Let's see. There's a chat. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, share the screen. Apologies for that. What do you people think? So I I, I chose yellow. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I chose yellow because the patient is uh, obeying commands, movements, peripheral pulses are there. Respiration is okay, and there's no major hemorrhage but he has major injuries because it is a crash injury. So yes. On the flow chart, he goes to delay, which is yellow. Yes, so he would be a yellow because he's not actively bleeding from anywhere. Um, he just crashed his feet. Um, so yes, categorically, he is a yellow patient. Um, and then number eight, track passenger walks in upset. Yeah, this one who's walking, the idea green. Number nine, Scalp wound with estimated blood loss of 500 ml, uh, respirations over 30, so it's been uh, quite respiratory distress. Um, Pulse of your present, mental status is confused. Yes, so he automatically becomes a red patient. And the final question is uh, six month pregnant female, broken left lower leg, uh, respirations under 30, present, mental status awake and oriented. Um, so again, this would be a yellow, not necessarily a red, um, because yes, they have a major injury, but everything else seems to be fine. All right. Um, so good, good. Oh, and sorry, just a moment. Yeah. Uh, the, the one with the dislocated shoulder. Yes. I, I missed the answer. Where did you place him? Uh, green. Green. Okay. Yes. So a dislocated shoulder, this is number four. Dislocated right shoulder, everything else seems fine. It's a minor injury uh, that one will be dealt with uh, quickly. Yes. Yeah. All right. Good. I believe Paul has another question he raised. Paul, go name. ahead. Uh, yeah, it's number seven. Um, uh, the reason for, because I chose red myself. Yes, go ahead. Um, the reason is uh, with the crushed feet, uh, out of my experience, one patient I had with crushed uh, foot. By the moment the crash, uh, you know, if, if especially if there was a compression and there's likelihood of a compartment injury, and the moment that pressure is released and they really deteriorate. And here you can see the, the pass rate is already 45 beats. I don't know. 90, the pass rate happened. is 90. So it's 45 beats in 30 seconds. It's a trick question. Oh, oh it's a trick question. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Yes. Exactly. Such, yeah, it's also, it's a 90, 90 beats per minute. Yes, all right. Yeah, okay, let's go for a yellow, yeah. Yes. All right. So good. I mean, again, um, so the important part of this and the whole like, this exercise is mainly is you need to have a GR system. If you are working in an ambulance system, then you need to go back. So I know a lot of you are talking about, oh, policy, oh, we need to go to the government, oh, we need to go. But if you are working in an ambulance system, you need to go back and pick whichever GR system, uh, whether you're going to use STAT, whether you're gonna use SALT, pick the GI system, train your personnel, train uh, your staff within that ambulance system, um, and then have it as part of your SOPs and understand. Uh, because even if you go to any mass casualty incident and you meet with another service, the chances of you misclassifying red patients if you are all using a triage system is very minimal or yellow misclassifying patients. So the important part is if you work for an EMS system, you should be able for any ambulance service, you should be able to have a triage system that's documented um, and with that is everyone in the system knows about it. Uh, and of course, a means of tagging patients when you get to the field. Uh, where you come across a crash or a major incident. All right, any questions before we move to the emergency department?
Andrew, I shall just. All right. Okay. Oops, sorry. All right. So I'll take quickly discuss ED management and go through some. So for uh, the ED, it's not uh, mass casualty management. What I'll be presenting on is mainly everyday manage uh, triage of patients, and we'll see why it's important that we have to triage patients in the emergency department. Um, so share sound, optimize for video. All right. Okay. All right. What up? facilities across Kenya um, don't have a triage system uh, in the emergency department. And uh, we've had many cases. I think what is common that you've had is Ngonjo Alikufa Kualaini or Alingojea so long before they died. Of course, there are normally other stories behind it, but there, we have a lot of patients uh, who we normally hear via the media uh, about patients dying waiting in queue patients dying because it took forever to get for them to be seen. And uh, essentially, a lot of this is potentially because we actually do not have any proper triage systems in many emergency departments across the country. So most of our facilities were designed as outpatient clinics, so which is on a first come faster basis, which necessarily would not be um, appropriate for an emergency department. So. As an introduction, so triage is a French word means sought, uh, is a process by which patients are prioritized and classified according to the type and urgency of their conditions. Uh, it was first used in World War I uh, to determine treatment priorities. Again, here the priority was to manage those who have minimal injuries so they can go back to the battlefields to fight. Um, so there are a couple of important things about triage um, and it essentially ensures that the critically ill or injured patients receive medical attention before the less ill or injured patients. Uh, it establishes acuity based on set guidelines. So that's the other thing is this have to be documented. So you can't say we have a triage system. So you ask, okay, so show us your system and no one actually knows the system. So it has to be a documented uh, set of guidelines that help with the triage. It helps inform the resources required, okay? So the type of treatment room required. So a patient who is crashing potentially needs to enter into the resuscitation room. A patient who has minor problems can then sit and wait and see BC in the waiting room and wait first come first served. So also but some of the benefits of triage also helps to make sure that you're not crowding your department with patients who can actually wait in the waiting area uh, to be seen by the clinicians. So it ensures smooth flow of patients and uh, removes the chaos that is many an emergency department where everyone is everyone and everyone is there and no one knows exactly what's going on. Um, it alleviates the anxieties of patients uh, that the caregiver knows they're in the system. So when a patient comes in, people 
people come uh, to the emergency department to see a healthcare provider, not to wait in line. So the moment someone is triaged, at least they are, they are comfortable knowing someone knows they are there. The anxiety and the chaos that normally happens in many waiting rooms is the person who is sitting there is not sure if the nurse or doctor knows they exist or they in the system. So the, one of the beauties about the triaging is at least you acknowledge the patient is there, you've assessed them, and you've determined they're not an emergency, so they can sit and wait. And you've communicated this to the patient, so they know, yes, someone has looked at me, and yes, I've been told that it's not an emergency, and I'll wait. But they have that comfort of knowing someone already looked at them. Okay, and of course, identifies the assessment frequency, so where a patient, as I said, triage is a dynamic process. So a patient who initially is uh, red would require more close monitoring or yellow versus a patient who is green who the monitoring may be less frequent. Okay, improves lines of communication. So if someone comes and says, I have a red patient, then we all know what the patient they're talking about. If someone says, I have a patient who is uh, triage green, then we all know what they're talking about. But if someone calls and says, I have a patient with a head, a cut on the head, then they're breathing. So we're not really sure, are they red, are they green, or we have to do the triage in our head. So the a beauty about triage is then it's easy to communicate even to the patients and explain to the patients that if you are a red patient, you'll be treated first. If you're a green patient, you'll have to wait. And it also helps in monitoring your wait times. Um, so ideally, uh, red patients need to be seen immediately, yellow patients potentially within half an hour or less. And then your green patients, ideally you want to see them sometimes within an hour or so. It depends on how much resources you have. But it also provides an opportunity for surveillance of predictable conditions uh, and ensures appropriate action is taken. So right now, especially with COVID, um, the importance of triage is you're able to immediately pick up at the triage desk who potentially has COVID and isolate them at the word, from the word go, not have them sit around your waiting area with everyone else coughing all over the place. And then by the time they actually being seen, half of your department has been infected with COVID. So I think a more important example of why triage is important is now during the COVID period where you want to quickly triage patients and isolate patients who uh, potentially have COVID and uh, would have a risk of spreading it to your staff and everyone in the emergency department while they're waiting in the queue. Similarly, we had the same for you know, there was TB and even now with other these other conditions that show up. So fundamentals of triage, and this is again across board. So whether it's a mass casual situation or daily the triage, there are few fundamentals uh, that are basic. So it's always not a first come first sub uh, principle. Patient security is assessed and categorized uh, using, sorry, patient is assessed and categorized using a set uh, criteria. And then there are set timelines for patient assessment based on acuity. So if a patient is triaged as red, then they need to be managed as an emergency. If the patient is uh, triaged at, uh, as green, then they need to be managed in a separate way. So treatment is initiated in a timely manner for the seriously injured patients, which is why it's uh, the whole process of doing triage is to ensure patients are getting care in a timely manner based on the, how sick uh, or injured they are. And of course, again, I mentioned it's a dynamic process where even if you've been triaged red, does not mean you'll stay red until uh, the end of your stay in the hospital. Is You could easily be red and uh, intervention is done and now you become green. Or you could be green, but then you deteriorate, then you become red. Okay. From an ED perspective, uh, the requirements for you to set up triage is you need a trained triage nurse with a set of documented printed out triage guidelines. Of course, a private room to ensure confidentiality of the patient, a desk, uh, two chairs, one's for yours, one for the patient. If you, you can have one for a relative, because there's always a relative around sometimes. And then a monitor to take your basic vital signs, blood pressure, pulse rate, uh, oxygen saturations, temperature, uh, things like a blood sugar should be available uh, to triage uh, for some patients and the additional tests which we'll be discussing that should be done uh, from the triage desk. And then of course, uh, patient's record chart to document. So the components of triage, um, essentially your patients should be identified, two names, date of birth, and there should be a registration number as per your hospital number. 
you need to get a sample history, a triage, so signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, pressure current medication present is on, past medical history, uh, pregnancy history, uh, last meal, then what actually brought the patient to the hospital. Uh, vital signs to be taken, uh, it is uh, blood pressure, pulse rate, SpO2, um, temperature, um, sorry, uh, so temperature, uh, sugar if a patient is required, especially in diabetic hypertensive patients, and again, pain score, okay, so pain score is part of triage, okay, how much pain is a patient in, because then if they in severe pain, that needs to be intervened immediately. Um, and then once you've done your vital signs, you've taken the history, then you assign a triage level and we go through one triage system. As Florian mentioned, there are even at an AD perspective, there are multiple triage systems. You just need to pick one, know it, have it printed out, have it clear to all your staff and also communicate to the patients so that everyone knows what system you're using. Okay, and then at triage also, you should be able to give appropriate health education and then document on the patient record chart your triage findings. So then this is as a means of communication to the doctor uh, or clinician who's gonna see the patient. So this is just a sample of a triage documentation. Um, as you can see, there's a file number, there's a date, arrival time, patient name, age, gender, then how did they come in, were they walking, stretcher, wheelchair, carried, uh, triage level, is it a resuscitation, uh, this is after you've done all your assessments. So are there resuscitation, a red, emergent would be yellow, urgent is, uh, uh, sorry, emergent would be orange, urgent would be yellow, less urgent would be green, and emergent would be blue. Okay, that's just one of the systems we use. Uh, it can be either a five-level triage or a three-level triage. Um, so a three-level triage, essentially you have a resuscitation as em and emergent as one, then you have an urgent category and then less urgent and non-emergent categories are, are the same category. Um, that's just like a basic oversight of how this works. All right, and then vital signs, uh, which you're picking up at triage, BP, pulse rate, respirate, temperature, level of consciousness. Uh, that's your AVPU scale, uh, sugar, uh, if appropriate for this particular patient, and then a pain score if pain is one of the characteristics they bring in the patient. Then you can see you put in your details for your sample history as picked up, and of course the triage name and signature um, then is put in. So I'll quickly go through CITES triage, that's a Canadian triage and equity score, emergency department triage and equity score, scale, sorry, uh, but again, this is just one example of a triage system. There are multiple, and uh, there's a lot of science and discussions, and I didn't say there's one better than the other. The most important part is what we'll go through is how, what are the categories, and how do patients end up in these categories? I think those are the most important, and each of the triage systems has this information, which then should be uh, appropriately um taught by you to your staff, practiced by your staff, and of course, uh, then documented. So the Canadian Triage and Acuity Scale is a criteria that was developed in Canada for the emergency department and later rolled out for pre hospital care due to its success and efficiency. Um, so as you can see, it's a five-level triage, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, okay? It's a tool that categorizes patients according to the type and severity of presenting symptoms. Just need to mute someone. There we go. Yes. Uh, and so, uh, if you're using CITAS, as you can see, so it's like some of the things, whichever triage system you use, you must have. So, what are the different levels? So this one has levels or categories. So, resuscitation, emergent, urgent, less urgent, not urgent. And then to be seen immediately, to be seen within 15 minutes, to be seen within 30 minutes, to be seen within an hour, to be seen within two hours. So this kind of information is what has to be clearly stated as part of your triage system. And more importantly, also communicated to your patients. Because if someone comes in and is, of course, should be triaged immediately, they arrive, or at least within five to 10, five to 15 minutes. If they are green, they should be told they are green, and they'll be told we'll be seeing you within an hour. If you are resuscitation, of course, then you'll be taken immediately. 
if you are urgent, uh, then you'll be told, yes, you're urgent, some intervention may start, but we'll see, manage within 30 minutes. So that's, so good triage, process, good triage program, uh, systems in a facility should have these characteristics. What are the different categories? What are the wait times for each of the categories? So again, triage category should be based on individuals need for care and not affected by the ED workload. So or financial incentives, organizational systems. This is an important part because in our system, any Mueshimi was a triage category red, even if they just coughed for once this morning. And this is one of the things that really needs to be looked into uh, in the ED system. Sometimes we categorize them that so that you can get them out of the department, not to cause the chaos, because they normally come with a lot of pomp and flair, and which disrupts your whole system in the emergency department. But rich people or people with resources should not be categorized red because they are rich, and uh, poor people categorized green. So yes, so it's not based on financial incentives. And again, if your workload, it's not based on ED workload. So if you are not busy, everyone is a red. If you are very busy then everyone gets pushed down to become a green you all wait for an hour so it should not be affected by that and of course um, it should be standardized and should not be varying uh, based on whatever system you're using so all patients should be allocated triage category according to the, uh, their objective so not subjective so objective clinical agency and we'll go through some of the criteria um so if you look at, let's say, level one resuscitation, and this is now like for this specific uh, triage um, system, but each system more or less around the same things. Uh, they may just have different uh, terminologies for the same. So patients who are at resuscitation would be, of course, as you can see, people in cardiac or respiratory arrest, major trauma, shock states, unconscious patients, patients in severe respiratory distress, status epilepticus, acute coronary syndrome or chest pain, cardio CVA, stroke, DKA patients would be categorized red, shock states, hypertensive emergencies, and here you can see they've also put in uh, vital signs that would guide you to say this is a red patient, uh, patients with GI bleeding, severe asthmatic attacks, changing sugars, so pregnancy related complications would end up being red, severe head injury, so these are patients, again, who need to be uh, managed immediately. <clears throat> so one of the things about such a patient is not, um, I see there's a question in the chat. So I think, okay, all right. Uh, all right, okay. So again, so someone uh, comment is, this is M Manchester. No, Manchester is a different system. Yes, anyway, we can have a look at that down the line. Um, so the main thing is, inner patient is determined as a resuscitation. So you are the person at triage and you determine this patient is a resuscitation. So the issue is not saying, oh, you're a resuscitation, put a plaster red. So this is different from the pre-hospital mass casualty incident situation. In an ED everyday triage, so it's not a mass casualty situation. If a patient is triaged as red, then there needs to be immediate intervention for this patient. So it's not saying it's red, oh, ah, yeah, let's continue triaging, everyone else will be back for you at some other point, okay? So this is a patient who needs to be managed immediately. Um, and if it's your patient is unconscious, of course, then you're looking at things in this issue of trauma, you're looking at suspend protection, airway, uh, assessment, whether you want to open the airway, head to chin lift or jaw thrust, suction the airway, insert OPA uh, for this patient. Uh, you want to look at their breathing. So this is a triage. So this is a resuscitation means you resuscitate the patient. Okay. Um, uh, are they breathing? What's their sides? And they need oxygen and that they need to be uh, provided for with a safe ventilation. And then if there's any active bleeding, of course, stop bleeding. So you see, uh, see ABCD, stop bleeding, put on monitor, start IV access and stuff, you to the station, uh, get blood samples, check the sugar, um, and at least start, start fluids to keep your vein open. So this is the situation where, let's say you were triaging a patient, you quickly came across this patient. So you need to intervene, not triage, then you leave them and say, 
Then you go say, uh, oh, there's a patient at triage 10 minutes ago, they are a red. No, no, no. They need interventions more or less immediately. And actually you need to call for help where you come across a red patient in the ED. Uh, level of consciousness, check the sugar, of course, warm the patient up. Okay. So those are your red patients who need to be managed more or less the moment you identify a patient is red, then you need to intervene immediately. If your patient is uh, uh, category orange, which is emergent, again, so they need to be seen within 15 minutes, but again, it depends, as I said, in some systems, the red and uh, orange are managed more or less immediately. Um, and uh, so you need to look, depending on what system you wanna use. All right, so these patients, again, with the altered level of consciousness, GCS 915, neonates, uh, eye pain, eye injuries, patients on drug overdose, intoxication, moderate asthma, anaphylactic patients, heavy PV bleeding, sepsis, uh, severe vomiting, diarrhea, um, psychosis, uh, severe hypotension, um, all need to be managed. Uh, severe abdominal pain, as you can see, assault, uh, patients on chemo, acute patients with acute pain. So that's why pain is part of your triage system. Patients with acute pain become an emergency because you cannot keep a patient in severe pain waiting the ED for an hour. Okay, and of course, patients know this is a seizure disorders. Okay, um, and the one level three, which is urgent, should be seen within. So they say these first three categories in some facilities are just managed all as one category. Um, and so these are patients who mild asthma, acute or moderate pain, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration, dialysis, other diabetic conditions uh, get categorized this way. And then these are more or less urgent patients, patients who don't need immediate intervention, minor trauma, moderate headache, uh, mild headache, earache, backache, your chair, vomiting, your ED. Majority of the patients coming through the emergency department are actually uh because um uh, our system doesn't have separate units will end up being a uh, level four or less urgent category um acute pain uh mild yes not uh, not urgent which is pretty much 90 percent of our emergency department patients unfortunately people with sore throat uh urti abdominal pain without vomiting diarrhea and vomiting alone without the idea so these are patients with mild uh, conditions. But as I said, the most important part of it is, uh, okay. the most important part of it is to actually have a system. Um, have a system that's documented, clear and reproducible and everyone knows about it and what interventions need to be done. And uh, if you look at the, now what we call important interventions are triage. So it's not just a matter Triage is not just a process of just taking blood pressures and then uh, uh, it's not a process of just taking blood pressures and then saying, oh, you are red, you are yellow. There are key important interventions that need to be uh, initiated at, at triage. And of course, your red patient's immediate resuscitation needs to be intervened at triage. And this is where you call for help. And because again, you don't want the triage nurse should not necessarily be involved fully in resuscitation because they need to go back. There's still a queue waiting for them, but they'd call for help and uh, ensure that their initial resuscitation is initiated for these patients and then go back and continue the triage patients. Because again, triage needs to be timely. Uh, it can't take an hour to be triaged, okay? Because then that then beats the purpose of triage because you will miss out on a lot of patients and you'll hear patients, the situation where patients uh, died waiting to be seen. I think it, most patients should be seen within 50, should be triaged within 15 minutes of arrival to the hospital, where how long after that you manage them then will be based on their category. Uh, so, uh, active bleeding should be stopped, asthmatic patients should be started on nebulization, patients presenting with chest pain, epigastric pain, pain in the jaw, left arm, all those signs suggest evolved. Um, uh, heart attack, then need to get an ECG done from triage. Um, and then patients need to be initiated on fluid resuscitation uh, from immediately after triage, especially then uh, shock. Anaphylactic patients need to be given adrenaline, uh, 0.3 milligrams IM, adult. Uh, Painkillers and antipyretics should be given from triage um, because even if someone comes in, let's say with a headache, 
and there's nothing else, then giving them two panadols will make them more comfortable waiting uh, to see the doctor from that perspective. Of course, article balsams will be full part of resuscitation in your patients. Uh, any uh, female of childbearing age with symptomatology, abdominal pain, should get a PDT done at, at triage again to determine uh, what's going on because uh, pregnant uh, abdominal pain with a PDT positive, then you're quickly moving to becoming more of a yellow uh, red patient, uh, but a uh, negative PDT and abdominal pain could be something else. Okay, of course, fracture and uh, dislocation and mobilization should be done from triage. Uh, this is always something we insist, uh, which is a common practice in Kenya, is do not give antihypertensives for high BPs in the ED, and by all means, don't perform gastric lavage for ingestions at triage. Yes. All right. So that's just a quick oversight of triage, and we'll get a chance to practice uh, triaging some patients. Uh, same way we did the pre-hospital, but at this point, what I'd want us to do is take some questions. Any questions? So maybe, I don't know, there's uh, Gladys, you're commenting about CITAS and Manchester. Maybe you can unmute and comment. Any comments, discussions around uh, ED triage. So same principles as pre-hospital triage, again, focus is have a system, okay? And so number two, everyone must know the system. Number three, patients must be triaged uh, within 15 minutes of arrival to the emergency department uh, based on your system and then now treated based on the different categories that you provided. Um, any questions? I have a comment. Eh? Go ahead, Marion. Yes. Yeah, and I think uh, what I am feeling as we go through this discussion is how hard it is to apply this in our public hospital setting. Eh? Why? Probably because of understaffing, staffing resources, other resources in terms of, eh? we find like there are 30 to 50 patients in. 15 of them or 20 of them are in that below 30 minute category, one of the red or orange or yellow. So by the time they get to be seen by the few clinicians who are available in time that they, they delay time to the treatment, either way, as much as you might have an effective trial system. But it, it, it's, it's interesting, it's a good system to implement. Yeah, I was just thinking that as we were going through. Um, a comment, so uh, that's a valid comment, and uh, yes, a lot of people will always complain that yes, there are a lot of sick patients presenting, and you uh, do not have uh, resources. So, um, and it's important um, that people the first part of it would be you need to know who is in the department, I think that should be the priority. Triaging patients, then you actually know how many red patients you have, how many yellow patients, orange patients, how many uh, red, uh, red patients, you, uh, yellow patients you have. But again, one of the things that, one of the challenges that we have is, again, if you're going to ask, tell your uh, office administrator that we need additional resources, what evidence do you have? So, and this is where then triage becomes a good advocacy tool to advocate for either more clinicians. So the, the couple of things when you're looking at the ED, so most EDs have a pattern of patient presentation. So uh, the patients, the times patients will show up, most of them will show up in the evening, in the morning, then there's no one in the afternoon. Or most of them will show up closer to the afternoon and morning are less busy. So and then you need to balance. So the tricky part is you need to balance your staffing and your patient flows. Uh, unfortunately, if you're not using real data to study this, then you'll always find that challenge where your staff flows and your patient flows are not in sync. And that's where you end up in a situation potentially you have more patients than staff, or you are, sometimes you have more staff than patients. 
from you. But a lot of this is, the important part is the data. So data on your patient flow process, uh, data on your triage categories also, because you, if you periodically are coming across where most of your patients are red and yellow, then you may need to look at a system where you have a separate uh, process for your green patients. Um, and I know I've worked in systems where the emergency department only dealt with your red, yellow, your red, orange, yellow patients using those categorizations, and your green and blue patients were dealt with in an outpatient kind of setting. So it's a balance. So all of this comes from developing a system um, and having the information to advocate for additional resources. I see a hand is up. Uh, uh, any, any comment on that, Marion, before I ask to, to come in? No, I just I fully agree with the reporting part and having data as being very important. I will implement that in my machine learning. Yes. Work. Because if you can actually go to your administrator and say, look, we are our best on our best capacity, we have four doctors working between eight and twelve. Between eight and twelve, we've received 30 red patients. How are we supposed to manage this situation? So, but you see, that can only discussion can only happen when you have the data. Yes. All right, uh, Trufosa. Actually, I think you've said most of uh, what I wanted to say. Maybe yes. Just to emphasize that triage is also important for um, deciding how you will distribute the available human resources. So if um, you have not done triads and you have 50 patients in the waiting room, as you said, and they mostly all will look severe, then it's hard for you to know where to assign um, maybe your more experienced staff um, so that they can be able to handle the patients faster and get the queue moving. So that would be one important thing. The other would be also having triad, then you're able to maybe monitor your um, the time it takes for a patient to be seen based on the category. And that now you can use as an advocacy tool to advocate for more human resource within the department. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, True. Uh, Florian, you have a comment? Just I wanted to summarize a little bit because uh, thank you for a very good presentation at first, but uh, I believe as long as we don't measure quality, we don't know how good we are. This is something I always say, it doesn't depend if it is in the hospital or if it is in a pre-hospital setting. Yeah? If we just believe we are good, then this is a very subjective feeling, but it it's not hard numbers and we cannot go to emphasize for anything with it. And a triage can really bring benefits especially in overcrowded uh, emergency departments. Um, we have a quite big emergency department in our hospital, and of course we are doing triage. But if I come, for example, with the rescue helicopter to smaller rural hospitals that perhaps sometimes don't have this, if they once get overcrowded, they never get rid of the crowd because it's getting into chaos. And this is what I was talking about earlier in my session. Uh, we need to remove the chaos because this will distract all efforts we make. Yeah? So I believe it is very necessary. And just this week, I was talking to one of our paramedic students in Kenya, and she is on a internship in a public hospital. And we were talking about how is it going in the emergency department? What are they doing? And of course, I was interested into their procedures there. Um, and she was telling me of we don't have a big ICU in this hospital, so we are not able to do airway management. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. But what do you do if you get a patient that requires airway management? And she just told me, we will put them on the ambulance and transfer them to another hospital. So we have to think the system from, the, from step zero again, because if even life-saving interventions cannot be made in this emergency departments, all structurization by triage won't bring benefit to the patients. Of course, it will bring benefits um, to the overall process in the hospital, but you won't save lives. So even if your hospital is not able to finally treat these patients, you need to start with emergency interventions and then transfer the patient and not transfer a patient in GCS3 without air airway management.
Benjamin, you're you're mute. You just need to unmute. Uh, thank you very much, Florian. And I think one of the things the one of the important parts of any emergency department, but even picking up on uh, the pre-hospital care system is you need to first, I know as healthcare providers, we want to always focus on the treatment and the management, but a more important role that needs to be done from the word go is defining the chaos. You need from the word go to define what the chaos is. So defining the chaos is knowing we have we have our well, emergency department is full, but we have 30 red patients waiting, 40 yellow patients. And so you need to be able to define the chaos because then you can now add, uh, look for resources to address the chaos. So if you cannot define the chaos, then it's very hard to, add, um, to provide the appropriate resources to deal with the chaos. So a very much important in any emergency department, it is not who is the, it's not actually who is inside the department being seen by doctors, it's actually who is outside waiting to be seen. And the important part is you need to be very clear who is outside. Those who are inside, you already know them. You need to know who is outside waiting to be seen. And that should be prioritized because then you're able to say, and in certain situations, for example, you can actually tell the green patients, it will take you two hours to be seen. Uh, and this is, of course, when you have the information that they're actually green and they can choose whether to wait or go. So controlling the chaos is, starts by defining the chaos. Uh, Henry, you have a comment? Uh, Henry? Okay, uh, maybe he'll be able to unmute his, to drop his hand at some point. All right, good. Okay. All right, so, uh, yeah. Henry, do you have any question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Now we can hear you. Okay, I wanted to ask a question. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. The You said something in the very last slide when you were talking about some important uh, notes at triage. You made mention of not giving oral antihypertensives. Yes. So I wanted to ask, that's doing triage, yeah. So I wanted to ask, does it have to do with protocols um, not giving oral antihypertensives during triage? Like, you know, I just wanted to know the reason why you don't have to give the oral antihypertensives. All right, I see Florian is dying to start answering the question. So go ahead, Florian. <laughs> okay. Yes, I mean, hypertension is no emergency yeah and so it doesn't need to be addressed at the triage counter yeah um we want to address things that really bring benefit to the patient at triage so uh, like benjamin said earlier ekg for patients with chest pain yeah control of bleeding those kind of stuff um perhaps ct bypass for stroke patients this kind of stuff but hypertension is no life threat hypertension is not even an emergency and hypertension is something that can be seen by a gp in a clinic outpatient department how However, so there is no benefit in giving them just oral antihypertensives. And on the other hand, if we want to give them oral antihypertensives, there are several treatment strategies you can follow. And um, just one size fits all isn't there in the antihypertensive treatment therapy. So uh, I believe this is nothing that the nurse should decide at this point. This is something that needs to be evaluated. And as I said earlier, hypertension is no emergency. <laughs> Yes. So uh, just to echo, yes, what Florian is saying, let me put it simply. Um, patients do not become hypertensive in the emergency department. So a patient, let's say, with a BP of 180, 110, you, they've probably been having this blood pressure for the last five weeks, for the last one year. It's you who's picked it up at triage now so it doesn't necessarily mean actually most of the time that 180 110 didn't happen now when you check the blood pressure the patient has been living with it comfortably for the last x amount of time because we don't know how long they've had this 180 110 so with that information it's not an emergency to try and drop that blood pressure because they've been fine before they came to hospital and had you not picked it up, they would potentially have continued living with that blood pressure. Um, and that's the importance of saying, management of the blood pressure is not an emergency 
for this particular patient who comes in with a very high blood pressure in the emergency department. There are a lot of guidelines. I think JNC, we're on JNC 8 now on hypertension. And I've put a chart, we have algorithms that you can read off, but if you just look at hypertension management guidelines, uh, you will never find anywhere someone tells you give oral antihypertensive as an emergency. Uh, specifically at triage where you've just picked up the patient's blood pressure is very high. They are down the line, they are what we call hypertensive emergencies, but that's a different discussion altogether. And uh, I think we need, we probably will have a topic uh, discussion around the management of hypertension in the emergency department. All right, good. Uh, yeah, sorry, Benjamin. Yes, go ahead. Just to add on, yeah? Yes. Um, normally with the hypertension, with the hypertensive emergencies, there are recommendations not to lower the blood pressure too much. So yes. again, it's a risk to give antihypertensives at triage because you might find like it's a stroke or cardiovascular emergency where you need to take precautions with how you're lowering the BP. Yes, good, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so it's just a matter of reading up on this. So it's never an emergency. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, any more questions or comments uh, before we triage some patients sitting in the waiting area? Yes, I agree with Trufosa. You're also more likely to cause harm by giving those antihypertensive. But actually, I think one of the things that I've seen a lot happen is you will give them the antihypertensive. Then after that, if they're not appropriately followed up, then they will not continue taking antihypertensive. So the people will still go up down the line. So um, never really an emergency. Yes, they need proper follow up to make sure there's compliance and then a good and so there's a good diagnosis a good understanding by the patient of the condition and a good understanding of the interventions that will need to be done to keep the patient safe and healthy down the line of a couple of uh for the rest of their lives we all right don't any cosmetic Sorry. There. oh yeah, yeah yes there's also that <laughs> yes to force go ahead sorry um i this hypertension issue seems to have um, annoyed a lot of people because I'm seeing in the chat still some questions about it. But maybe you could um, explain the difference between a active emergency. Just think that maybe where. Okay, uh, it's very possible. Let me just open up our algorithms. I'll share this on the screen just now. Um, let's uh, share screen there. All right, so you can download this from our website. I'll put the link on the side there. I'm just looking for hypertension here. Uh, hypertension algorithm. Okay, so what is a hypertensive emergency? So essentially, Hypertension, hypertensive emergency is a condition where you have extremely high blood pressure, again, usually above 180, 110, uh, especially for BP, and patient has features of what we'd call end organ damage, okay, so end organ damage, and this would be, so there are three, uh, two, main, uh, three main, two main categories, is either neurological or cardiovascular, so patients who are having a stroke, and uh, or patients who are hypertensive and cephalopathy will normally present with confusion. Um, that's the most common. Uh, patients who have a severe headache or bleeds, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage. So these are patients from a neurological perspective are having a hypertensive emergency. And then from a cardiovascular perspective, patients in acute heart failure, patients in uh, so with acute pulmonary edema, patients in heart failure, patients having a heart attack. Uh, left ventricular dysfunction, patients having aortic dissection, then from a cardiovascular perspective, they're said to be having an emergency. And then other categories would be patients with acute renal failure, insufficiency, patients with retinopathy, and things give more grade four. Uh, Preeclampsia like eclamps, patients, of course, would be a hypertensive emergency, and even them, the BP, the BP is not that high. And then micropathic angiopathic hemolytic anemia. Now, in terms of the management of hypertensive emergencies, um, again, the priority, number one, hypertensive emergencies are not managed by oral antihypertensives. Let's just start from there, okay? Why? Because you need to lower the BPs in a controlled manner, and once someone swallows a pill, 
it's very hard to control how much effect that pill will have uh, time. So the hypertensive emergencies are managed by intravenous antihypertensives. Uh, of course, if they are available, but yeah, in certain settings, you may just have to work with uh, what you have. But yes, most of the times it's IV medication. And then normally the dropped, there's also, you don't want to drop them to a normal. You want to drop them, as you can see, the different categories, categories for different uh, conditions. And uh, you can see, for example, for a stroke patients, you only want to drop it below 180, 110 for, your, for you to allow you to thrombolize the patient. Uh, for in certain conditions, encephalopathy, you want to 25, 20 25% drop. So it's very titrated because, again, you don't want to worsen the condition uh, by dropping the blood pressure too much. So I don't want to dwell. There's a lot of info, again, that you can access around management of hypertensive emergencies. Uh, and so out of the categories that we have discussed, then the rest is not a hypertension. It's not an emergency. Patient has hypertension, full stop, not a hypertensive emergency. All right, good. Uh, so uh, any other questions? Let me see if I can get the triage chat. Sorry, this is too small. Um, so we're gonna triage some patients and uh, let me see if I can I'll project the triage chat that you can use. And then uh, from there, let's just see. Is it us? I think Williams has a question, so perhaps we can just yes. let him ask this one. Yes. Williams, you can unmute and ask a question. Good morning. Morning. Uh, this is F. Williams. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. What about you are called, maybe I'm talking about pre-hospital now, not in hospital. Maybe you are called to respond to an emergency and get to the scene or the uh, it's a medical emergency. When you go there and you found out that this patient is hypertensive, and when you check the blood pressure, the blood pressure was about 200 over 130 or 110. And the distance is very far. So what are you expected to do at that particular time? Does it mean that you are not going to give any intensive job before going to that place, going to your definitive care due to the distance, or you are just going to watch this patient, transport this patient without any, without any medical uh, intervention? So I just want to know, or we are going to abolish the oral hypertensive, or we should give IV antihypertensive. So I just want to know, I just want to be clarified about that. Sir. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Florian. It's pre-hospital. Okay. <clears throat> so it, of course, depends on your local protocols. If you have local protocols or SUPs or whatever in place that allow you to drop the blood pressure in the pre-hospital setting, then you can consider. I don't say you have to do it. You can consider it. Because, again, it's the same as Benjamin mentioned before. If there is no sign of end organ damage or failure, there is no indication to drop the blood pressure in the emergency setting. And this also also is what results from the algorithms Benjamin just showed. Um, you always need to ask yourself the question, does the patient have any problems from this hypertension right now? So if the patient is complaining about severe headache, about uh, nausea, perhaps vomiting, then it could be caused by the hypertension you will need to ask about the patient's history. You need to do sampler and you need to check out what is the history of the patient? What problems is he suffering? Does he have usual hypertensions? Does he already have a continuous medication he perhaps only didn't take? And if you answered all these questions, then you can decide whether it's necessary or if it's beneficial to drop the blood pressure. I can say from our system here, I know many colleagues as well, paramedics as also physicians that do what I always call cosmetic therapy. So they will just lower the blood pressure because it looks nicer if it is 160 and not 195. But 
is there a benefit for the patients? If we look into research, there isn't. We won't find benefit for patients that don't have end organ failure. And the problem is, as we mentioned before, especially in the pre-hospital setting, it will be difficult to make sure the patient doesn't have any cardiovascular problems. Of course, you can do 12 lead ECG, but you won't be able to do echo. You don't know how is the aortic valve? Are there any problems? How is the heart pumping? And so I wouldn't recommend to lower this blood pressure in a regular setting. All right, thank you very much, Florian. And I think I'll echo your same sentiments. It's rarely do we ever need to drop a blood pressure uh, unless your patient is having an emergency. Most of the time, as Florian said, if it's a patient who skips their morning doses, we'll just give them, take your own medication and continue their life and then follow up with your GP uh, wherever you are at. All right, good. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm gonna project um i can only get uh let's see i can only get three of the categories on the screen so we'll use that all right oh sorry not that one uh new share um yes so here are your triage categories so i'm gonna put up the patients um and you can take a stab at triaging these patients so, okay, so patient one is a patient is brought in post motorcycle accident. He has an obvious deformity on the right lower limb with external rotation. Uh, on assessment, he scores A in AFPU, blood pressure is 160-71, heart rate is 162. He's very apprehensive and he's yelling in pain. All right, question two. Uh, eight year old lady is brought with a history of sleeping too much, uh, breathing noisily and frothing from the mouth. Uh, on assessment, she scores a U uh, on the apple scale and uh, BP 146.87, heart rate 86, sugar is one millimole per liter, saturating at 76%. Patient number three, adult female, complains of cough and chest pain for three days. She's, uh, she says she's feeling a little weak. BP 130, 60, heart rate uh, 102, SPO2 96%, temperature 37.9 degrees centigrade. Patient three, four, 35 year old female, complains of left leg pain and swelling for one week. On assessment, she is stable. Patient five, a 70 year old male patient known to be diabetic and hypertensive, presents with complaints of passing a lot of urine, especially at night. He also reports to be feeling very thirsty and is therefore taking a lot of fluids, but, appear, but still appears uh, dehydrated. Question six, a 27 year old. A uh, patient presents with complaints of a sore throat, mild cough for one day, BP 11467, uh, heart rate 86, uh, respirate 14, saturating at 100%, temperature 36 degrees centigrade. Patient 7, a uh, 51 year old male presents with complaints of nausea and vomiting for three days. BP 151.10, pulse rate 79, saturating at 100%. Patient 8, uh, 36-year-old man presents with left leg pain and deformity post-fall. On assessment, patient has pain, score 10 over 10. Uh, BP 140.87, heart rate 104. Patient 9, 68 year old lady, presents with substantial chest pain, shortness of breath. Upon taking vitals, she collapses on the bed. On assessment, she has no pulse. And the last patient is, patient has come for a dressing of a cut wound. Uh, he sustained two days ago. There's no active bleeding noted. All right. You have 10 patients waiting in your waiting area. You quickly need to triage them so that you can manage them uh, in a timely manner. All right, submit your answers, then we'll be able to go through the query results. Uh, 
Yeah, this one is much harder than the pre-hospital one. Eh? Okay, submit. Okay, a good number of already submitted. All right, good. Submit. Submit your answers. All right, still some still have to submit. Still waiting on a few more. Um, I see two comments. How my screenshots? Uh, submit on the, not on the chat. I'm seeing someone's already giving answers on the chat. So <laughs> Paul on the, on the triage, on the process there. All right, still waiting for a few more. Yo, do what you want to do. Come on, how are you? Short and resultant. All right. Okay, still people are still submitting. All right, uh, half 30 more seconds and we'll reveal the answers. All right, um, so let's look at the answers. Uh, share results. So you should be seeing this on your window. Um, so a patient is brought in motorcycle accident. He has obvious deformity on the right lower limb with external rotation. Uh, he's a lat. BP 160.71, heart rate 126. He's apprehensive and dealing in pain. So orange or yellow? looking at the majority of the answers. So people are torn between orange and yellow. Okay. Any, anyone wants to comment? Again, feel free to just comment. Okay, all right. So based on his pain score, so if you look at the categories, if you look at orange, uh, so what does it take on the orange side? Uh, he's in acute pain, okay? So assuming he's screaming in pain, uh, nothing else. And uh, yep, I think that's the only thing he would categorize in the orange part. So on a pain score perspective, he probably would end up being, um, and yeah, he probably would end up being an orange to be seen in 15 minutes. Uh, otherwise, he'll be yelling for some time in your emergency department. Yes. Okay. So I'd also go with uh, orange on this particular patient. Okay. Um, and then number two, of course, if you disagree, please feel free to unmute and comment. Uh, I have a comment. Go ahead. I also, yes. I also selected orange. Yes. But I'm looking at uh, major trauma on level one, and I'm wondering. Uh, the red, eh? Yes. Major trauma, <laughs> or with a deformity. 
it's one limb i would mm-hmm. not really categorize it as major trauma uh, i mean yeah of course it's painful if you break a leg it's very painful uh, <laughs> but major trauma if in my opinion would be someone with multiple injuries not just an isolated limb injury and he seems to be based on his vital signs uh, though uh the tachy could be because of pain his bp seems to be holding we don't see any other injury so i'll probably also just put him as not as major trauma yeah okay all right so patient two eight year old boy uh, brought to the history of sleeping too much breathing noisily frothing from the mouth um she's unresponsive yes i totally agree this is a resuscitation case uh sugar is extremely low and needs to be dealt with uh immediately and then she needs to be put on oxygen so some things that need to be done automatically from triage uh on this particular patient uh, patient three female complains of a cough uh chest pain for three days she says she's feeling a little weak bps are fine saturating for well she's a bit of a fever starts are well heart rate is 102 yes so i see a lot of people thought this is urgent um so let's look at what does she have so three days chest pain um bps are fine uh heart rate bit of a tacky which could be from the fever uh she's saturating fine um really doesn't so if we were to if we were to say um yeah so i don't think she's not a resuscitation case for sure uh she's not an emergency um because i really can't pick she has a bit of fever uh but beyond that do we yeah bp is fine i would put a septic shock or anything so she could easily be she's not in pain fever yeah and probably she has a urti cough a bit of chest pain uh so if you look at category green uh, urti symptoms with fever should be potentially fall under that um so i'd go with the people who thought she was green question 4 35 year old female complains of left leg pain and swelling for one week on assessment she's stable she's had it for a week I uh, would not necessarily call it an emergency now that she's showed up. Um she so but she's in pain. Okay, so left leg pain, uh green, minor trauma, back. So it depends on her level of pain. So she could easily be a green uh on the pain, so it will all be dependent on the pain score. Um yes, nothing really prioritizes her as an emergency so a 70 old female patient known to be diabetic hypertensive complains of passing out of urine at night also reports feeling very thirsty and is therefore taking out of water but still appears dehydrated of course naturally you'd want a bit more information on this patient uh but he is dehydrated um we don't have any vital signs he's diabetic is diabetic and hypertensive with dehydration uh orange um so if you're looking at if it's orange why orange anyone wants to comment no one wants to no one wants to commit themselves okay but diabetic dehydrated um i'd probably again go with orange though yellow uh vomiting or diarrhea with dehydration he is dehydrated um so orange yellow so again you'd have to prioritize based on whatever resources you have but you also need more information if his sugar is extremely high then he ends up as actually a red because then he ends up around issues of dka so again more information will provide you and that's why it's important to get additional that's why your sugar in some instances even a deep stick urinalysis are part of triage because then would move this that will determine where this patient is because if it's just dehydration bp's are fine that's a different discussion versus a dka patient 
So orange yellow would suffice. Transevia patients complain of a sore throat, mild cough one day. Yep, uh, everything is fine. Yeah, not urgent. So I'd go with the blue, uh, the blue guys. 51 year old male patient complains of nausea and vomiting for three days. BP is fine, pulse is fine, uh, the rest is fine. There's no dehydration. Uh, vomiting and diarrhea with no sense of dehydration. Yes, could be a green patient. So well done on that one. And then the 36 year old man presents with left leg pain, deformity post fall on assessment. He has a pain score of 10 over 10. Uh, BP of that, yes, he's an orange, he's severe pain. Yes, uh, he would not be a resuscitation patient. Once you address his pain, he should be fine. And then 68 year old patient presenting with substantial chest pain, shortness of breath. I, I'm impressed. A lot of you definitely picked up. Uh, this patient probably is having a heart attack um, and that potentially needs to be addressed. And of course, then she collapsed, uh, which is a resuscitation case. And then patients come for dressing, yeah, for sure, blue. Yes, okay, not urgent. All right. Okay, uh, we have five minutes. I don't know whether you'll be able. Uh, let's see, we can take five minutes to do one more poll, the last one before we call it a day. So there we go. Uh, same ED, second group of patients. Uh, go ahead, look at the questions and vote. So. Question one, adult 75-year-old patient presents a three-day history of general malaise, headache, fever, slight cough, appears stable, but vital signs just having a fever. Second patient, patient presents with two-week history of intermittent lower back pain, took some analgesics. Third patient, 26-year-old brought post fall from a height, uh, uh, scores U in AVPU, deep cut on the head, bilateral periobital lechemosis, nose bleeding, uh, BP, respiratory weight, SATS of 65, yeah. Patient four, 30 year old man, complains of a painful right leg post fall. There is no obvious deformity and is able to walk. Um, there are lacerations on the knee, shin that isn't bleeding, vital sense fine, pain score for out of 10. Patient five, uh, adult male patient with multiple stab wounds to the torso and upper back, brought to the ED, attacked by thugs in his house. He scores A in the post call. Clothes are covered with in blood. Vital signs BP1, 1080, heart rate 95. Interesting. Question six, uh, adult male is here for review for his tool culture report after treatment four days ago with GE. Vitals are stable. Question seven, 25 year old lady presents complaints of persistent nausea and vomiting for three days. Uh, she's eight weeks pregnant. On assessment, sick looking dehydrated, BP 90-50, heart rate 102. Interesting. Question eight, 50 year old lady complains of abdominal pain and one episode of diarrhea after eating at a function. She's worried because she's diabetic. BP pulse and everything, pain score five. And then question nine, 32 year old male patient presents the emergency department with difficulty in breathing, tachypnea and wheezing. On assessment, he's in obvious distress and using extreme muscles to breathe. Vitals, SAT 64, heart rate 30, more than 30, heart rate 127 beats per minute. And then final patient is a 45 year old lady who came, has come for prescription refill of antihypertensive and oral hypoglycemics. BPs are that, just put on sugars and all that. Is that. All right, good. Two minutes submit so that we can all quickly go through the three results and call it a weekend. Good votes are coming in. Ah, nice.
All right, any last submissions before we end this poll? Uh, it's uh, 12 o'clock, so we quickly need to finish this. All right. Uh, I think we have most people have been submitted. You can just submit it to the point you are at now. Then you go through the results. I see people are still submitting. Oh, nice. People are still submitting. Okay. Uh, no more submissions seem to be coming through. All right, we can look at the results. All right, share results. All right, so first patient, uh, 75 year old, three days history of general malaise, fever, slight cough, uh, other stable assessment, BP, heart rate is 90, but, uh, BP 140, 90. It's like running a bit of a fever, SP 96 is a lot. Yeah, it probably would be a green. Uh, nothing really prioritizes him as an emergency. An old patient presents with two history of intermittent loss. Yeah, he looks like he, yeah, he is not urgent. So blue, not urgent. Post fall, deep cut on the forehead. Uh, of concern, of course, you can note is his unresponsive his respiratory is at eight he's saturating at 65 this is a resuscitation case for sure remember when you say orange means this patient will have to sit there give or take for 15 minutes before you attend to them i really don't think so this one will be need immediate intervention uh 30 year old man complains of painful right leg post fall his no obvious deformity is able to walk laceration on the knee and shin that isn't bleeding bps are fine pain score for over 10 Okay, not that bad. So I'd probably move him to potentially, because of his pain, then maybe I'd give him a yellow, but mostly a green is actually quite good. Uh, pain score, he's just moved one up from green and yellow, so um, less urgent potentially. And five adult patient with multiple stab wounds to the torso, upper back, brought to the AD, uh, attacked by thugs in his house. On assessment is A, he's covered in blood, uh, BP 11080, and uh, yes, uh, heart rate 95. So I agree, yes, orange, um, it's just multiple stab wounds, but he seems to be, we need a bit more information in terms of respiration and saturations. But based on the information that we have, well, yeah, orange actually would be uh, appropriate. Someone never has a comment on I that? Am, I am begging. I am begging. Beg, to beg. Yes, tell us. <laughs> yes. So um, now this is major trauma because there are yes. multiple stab wounds. Eh? So yeah. it could be that he just came quickly enough. But if you delay him for 15 minutes, he could easily cross into now the, the shock, signs of shock, the poor vital signs. Eh? Yes. So in my opinion, this is a red patient. This, yes. Um, and that's acceptable. And that's the thing. I mean, um, I don't think anyone would argue with your assessment of this patient. Someone else would want to argue that maybe it's not red, maybe it's orange. So again, it's the difference, I'd say, for example, if you had five other significantly traumatic patients, then this can yes, move to an orange. But if he's the only patient in your department, then you can't actually have him sit down and wait for 15 minutes. So I agree with you. Yes, it could be a resuscitation. I see there's a comment. People are putting it in the chat instead of just, uh, it's red. Yes, sour. Okay, we all agree. Happy to take it red. But even the people who voted orange, I would actually say it still would be cut. It would, because he is not in shock yet. So 
uh, it's not that you will wait 15 minutes for to be seen, but um, an orange, he's within red and orange, yes. Nothing, if he was unconscious, hypotensive, then yes, we can quickly move him to red, but even orange is fine. So both answers would be accurate. Six adult male patient is here for review. Is to not 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 urgent at all. No, uh, twenty five year old male presents with complaints of persistent nausea and vomiting for three days. She's eight weeks pregnant. On assessment, she's look, sick looking, dehydrated. She's hypotensive and heart rate one or two. Red or orange? Very red. Yeah. Uh, why? The BP is below 60 diastolic. It's 1950, very red. Okay, anyone, why orange? For those who may have chosen orange. So I put agree with red. She has a pregnancy related uh, complication, and this part I'm worried more about an ectopic pregnancy. Um, she is already showing signs of shock. There's a comment, sorry. Uh, uh, ben, I was just saying, if I agree, this nausea and vomiting could be contributing to you no know, hypovolemia. Yes. So I think yellow. I, I mean, urgent. The orange. Orange. So she is very dehydrated, uh, shock. So again, red, orange. Most of the uh, needs to be managed more or less immediately. So yes, if you're looking at orange. the fifty. Uh, orange, someone else is saying orange. Go ahead, why? If we just follow the criteria, then it's orange. I mean, of course she's pregnant and of course she should be seen as fast as possible, but she's orange. I mean, there is no immediate life threat, so she doesn't need immediate treatment. Of course she should be seen as fast as possible, but nobody dies from BP 90 to 50 and a heart rate of 102. This is not a severe shock. And of course the unborn child can be harmed, but per definition, orange. <laughs> Right. Okay, good. So she's, if, for example, like, um, I'd not seen that, she's not complaining of any abdominal pain, but so she's nausea and vomiting. But if this patient, let me ask it differently. If this same patient presented with severe abdomen, with abdominal pain for the last two days, and this was her, what category would we give her? No nausea and vomiting, just abdominal pain. Red in that it should move because you need immediate resuscitation. So from a perspective of, do you need immediate resuscitation? Red. Do you need to be managed urgently, emergently, then orange? So yes, so again, uh, orange, but again, if she's the only patient, then you should be the first one to be managed, of course. Number eight, 50 year old lady complaining of abdominal pain, one episode of diarrhea after eating at a function. She's right, she's diabetic, BP, all that are fine. Again, uh, from a pain score, yeah, she's still uh, five out of 10. Moderate pain, so yellow from that, but others, apart from the pain score, she's a green patient, yes. And then, uh, ninth, a few main patients present the emergency department difficulty in breathing, tachypnea. Uh, this one automatically is a resuscitation case because of the uh, significant hypoxia and all the other problems they're having. And the final patient is prescription refill for sure is not urgent. All right. But again, thank you very much. Remember, triage is dynamic. So not to say that uh, if a patient is triaged green, they can't become a red. If a patient is triaged red, they can't down triage. So it depends on uh, where you are to your patient at a what point. At this point, I'd like to take any final questions. Uh, if any people have any questions or comments before I say a big thank you to um, Florian uh, for really helping out with this presentation around the pre-hospital triage. And thank you all for participating um, and uh, remember, we have our talks. If you want 
We have a whole page on triage, but this is more AD triage. Let me see if I can share that. Um, so if you forward emergencyvisingkenya.org forward slash triage, uh, you should be able to, so it's a whole page on triage uh, on our website and should be able to pick up, uh, get all the tools. So there's a whole triage handbook. If you want a copy, there's a triage chat for the AD um sample patient triage form if you want one uh we have a waiting room poster if you want a waiting room poster for your ad uh this is some work with, we've just started doing it in swahili we'll get the english one done um and then of course if you want to do a quiz on triage um then you can take the quiz and learn how to do some triage um Similarly, please, we have these talks every end of the month, uh, last Saturday of the month. Um, so if you have, um, join us for the next ones. You, we normally will advertise um, on the website and on social media where the next talks are. I'm quickly trying to get the feedback form for you to quickly fill your feedback form. Um, uh, put the link on the chat. Let me just put it on the chat now. Yes, so please share your feedback and uh, give us, uh, if you are interested in any other topics that you'd like us to cover, feel free to share along, give us your feedback, tell us what you'd like to hear. And um, I see there's a comment from Trufosa that highlights the need for experience on training in triage. We should not put unsupervised students in triage as is common practice. I totally agree with uh, Trufosa on that one. The triage should be done by an expert um, so that they're able to quickly pick up who needs immediate care, who needs to wait. If you put a, someone who's not experienced, then you risk um, not actually triaging patients appropriately. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for the nice comments, Frank. And uh, I will leave the link on the um, chat for you to give us your feedback. And then we will see you last Saturday of next month. And uh, go practice, go implement triage in your EDs, go implement triage in your ambulance services. Um, this is something you can easily do all by yourself. All the resources are available. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Florian. And I think you're on post night shift, so you can go sleep now. And um, yeah. we'll see you next month. And Nigeria people, thank you very much for joining us also in Kenya. All right, everyone, have a lovely weekend. Uh, see you next time. Bye, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.